Welcome to uh, our union session on uh, vegetation climate interactions across uh, time scales. I'm very pleased to see so many faces already at uh, 8.30 in the morning, so that's uh, very nice. Um, I would just like to shortly discuss a little bit the background why we thought it'd be nice to make such a union session. Um, so I visited the Institute, the LSCE, uh, last year and started talking with people working on, on deep time processes uh, and the interaction of vegetation and climate in deep time. And I thought it was so interesting that I thought it would be nice to have people discuss these topics also in the context of more modern processes. And this basically started uh, the idea for the session. And over the last months, getting the session together was very much uh, interesting and a pleasure to see so many different topics uh, come together. And basically, this accumulated to the session we have today. And the outline of the session focuses on deep time processes before the coffee break, and after the coffee break we'll move towards more present and short-term uh, processes that connect vegetation and climate. Just to shortly outline what we'll talk about before the, the coffee break, Jill Ramstein, who is also partly convening uh, uh, the session, will talk about uh, uh, the processes in general, and also cover some of the processes that Yves Gaudry um, was supposed to talk about, but because of personal reasons, he could not be here. Then, at nine o'clock, we'll uh, continue with Zonke Seele, and he will talk about the terrestrial carbon cycle and carbon nitrogen interactions across time. Pierre Sepulcher, quarter past nine, will talk about the diversification of angiosperms. Uh, 9.30, Alain Frank, uh, we'll talk about the evolution of palms and the global historical biography. At 9.45, Valérie Galli. We'll talk about the link between the evolution uh, of the terrestrial biosphere and the Indian monsoon. So for now, we'd like to give the floor to Jal Ramstein. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, I, I have to say some words about yeah, what has Hugo told you? First, I, I'm, very I'm very glad that uh, so many also people are here and that can, they can listen from the beginning to the end of this session, which will last uh, all the morning, but will span uh, several million, hundred of million of years. So the, the idea comes because uh, Hugo gave a very brilliant seminar at LSE. I discussed with him in the corridor, and then I, I told him, you know, there is a deadline for union session at EGU. It would be great if we do that. But the dead deadline was two days after that. So, so he works in the train, we work together, and we were able to, to build a first proposal, and it comes through. I have to say that this session, union session, is, is built by four dif different divisions. And I think the EGU, because there is so many people, I think it's a good, good place to make multidisciplinary science. So we will, tr we will try to do that and to make you travel from deep time to interaction between evapotranspiration and cloud, instantaneous physics, in this uh, two or three hours. So I go now to the, the session, and, uh, and the session is, as uh, Hugo said, really intending from the beginning and mostly origins. They were leaking before, of course, they're in Silurian, but the real spread of terrestrial uh, uh, vegetation and interaction is really linked to Devonian. That means also that I will come back on that, that the terrestrial history is a short, short part of the, of the history of life on Earth. So, unfortunately, as Hugo said, if we go from deep to, to the top of the figures, uh, Eve will not be here. I couldn't do his talk because he is working on different topics than I. So I suggest to Eve to give me only three slides and I will talk about this three slide at the end of my introduction, and this will cover half an hour. Then we decide to, to give the floor to Zong Zala, because it is a processes analyze and study from carbon and nitrogen through time, and this is quite interesting to fix the framework. And then we begin the travel, and uh, Pierre will, will talk about uh, angiosperms, dispersion, uh, <clears throat> which, 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 which is very interesting topics, and after that, Alain Franck will also 
give a good view on historical and geographical distribution of palms. Then I think uh, it will not be Valier Galit, but uh, Christian Franz Lanor, because Valier was not able to come, but Chris and I knew him, will do it very well the job, on the C3, C4, and what we can think about that from the Bengal fan. And then we will come to more discussion on what we are. We are, we are um, uh, so the emergence and the context of life at the beginning of the Tortonian to the Pliocene by Camille Contou. And then we will go to quaternary science with <clears throat> Victor Brofkin and Jed Kaplan talking about quaternary, all the same for, 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 for Victor, and the last quaternary for, for, for Jade. And then there will be a little bit changes because the gentleman cannot attend the conference. So during that 15 minutes, the people from the nine posters, they get about one minute, one minute and a half to present their posters. And then we will go to present day and future with a presentation of Jordi, which is really, as I told you, instantaneous physics from evapotranspiration to cloud, and finished by Gregory de Villiers, which will take about, talk about the satellite use to better understand and control our environment. Our environment. So the, the next slide is just to remind you, of course, that there is a poster session, and this poster session will allow you to continue this travel uh, along the, the, the Earth's history at Myosin, Olsen, but also in future climate change, even with uh, <coughs> future uh, uh, development of vegetation in China, for instance. So there is nine posters that will be presented anyway instead of the giant team talk. Okay, now we are here all together to talk about the interaction between terrestrial biosphere and climate. And as I told you, this is a very small part of the history of Earth on life. But it's a quite interesting for us because we live on Earth and also because this story is quite well constrained from many points of view. So <clears throat> I will try to demonstrate that there are very important and key issues for this history and that we know a lot of processes and we can make good physics and biology with that. Um, just to say that for us, even if during Silurian there is some lichen, the story will begin during Devonian. This is the origin. Next, next four slides are a bit historical. It is, for me, the people that were quite important. So we can share that or not share that, because of course, for each one of us, there are very important people in science corresponding to interaction. To so it's not really exhaustive. It's just my view, and I will try to give some concepts that I will use later. So the first one is uh, Vladimir Vernatsky, in fact, Vladimir Vernatsky, born in St. Petersburg in 1863 and died, and died uh, <clears throat> in, in 1945, just at the end of the world. And so, due to that, he is not very well known, but he has an AGU medal called Vernatsky Medal. So, for the scientist, it is somebody that is quite well known, but he has not a large audience. And this is mostly because he died in a context just after the world, and his work was not so well known in Western Europe. But he is really one of the first fathers with Goldsmith of the geochemistry. He works a lot on the interaction between um, cosmic and solar radiation and living organisms. I think he is one of the most important person on the concept of global biosphere and terrestrial biosphere, understanding that as a whole and in interaction to the other components. And moreover, he was one of the first to understand the impact of humankind on terrestrial biosphere. So for me, it's really somebody who is not so known in, in, in Western Europe, whereas he has pay, played a very important role. Another one which is more famous is James Lovelock. Uh, James Lovelock, born in England, in 1919, he's still alive, and he has done many things. But what I will summarize here for my purpose is the fact that certainly he was very interesting in, for his ideas in two, for two major issues. As you know, his conceptual idea was Gaia, the Earth, was a kind of living organism able to stabilize and to, to, to keep equilibrium 
So this is a major idea. But beneath that, there is the idea, which is quite important, that living organisms participate to the climate and are not only forced by geological data. They are inside the problem. And the second idea is that we have to consider the Earth as a whole, which I think has very important impact on modern science. So, just to say that he has come some, some followers, and as you know, one of his followers was Hans Joachim Schnellhuber, and this is what he said about uh, Lovelock, that it was the second Copernicus revolution. And I think this sentence is to say that we, we have the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe a long time ago, and we didn't realize on which planet we live, and this is certainly something very important in the idea of Lovelock, to try to make us think of all the interactions possible of the Earth as a rule. And this is certainly a big contribution. A last word to say that if you don't know anything about this question, you can read the paper from Lenton with there, which is, I think, a nice introduction to uh, what is interesting in Lovelock thought. So the second slide on Lovelock is just to say that he provided some years ago a conference at the AGU with many, many people. But you know, in the 60s, 70s, his ideas were really controversial. But no, I think uh, at least this part of his idea is, is considered quite positively. And I show here that, in fact, this idea of the Earth as a rule, during the 70s, 80s, 90s, and due to the GX scenarios that are here, you can see that uh, all the components of the Earth system have been built, and that now we are able to have an idea, not complete, not exhaustive, but a good idea of the different components of the Earth system who are responsible for climate changes. And this, this is, I think, something that is belonging to the heritage of Lovelock, including, I, fi I think, the idea of Schnellhuber in the IPGP. So I think it was really well known and famous. And the last one for me is uh, Bob Berner. Bob Berner, he, he, he is, he is born in 1935 and died two years ago. And he is really the guy that tried to understand, and I'm a model, and to model the evolution of the CO2, first with Black, with Lazaga and Garrett, with the models that try to do that to evaluate the CO2 changes through the Cenozoic and then through GeoCarb to include by a kind of cumulative processes, all the interaction that could lead to modify the CO2 in the atmosphere. And I, I, I only show here one plot, and this plot is the, the CO2 changes during 250 million years, and this is the kind of way that Berner was working, parameterizing, and so here it's the effect of fertilization, weathering and erosion on the CO2 with different parameterization zero for no interaction, one for all the Earth interacting, and he, he fit the parameter to 0.4 in, 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 in his GeoCarb3 model. So these ideas of trying to integrate all the, all the things were certainly a good thing. I, I know that now, especially from Donadio Goderis and this team, uh, the, the Bruno model has been increased to a 3D model with a real special distribution of erosion and weathering whether, whereas Berner, anyway, was more a zero-D model in, in terms of understanding the spatial distribution very exhaustively. This is finished from the historical point of view. I know I want to go to two major spread. The first one is uh, the beginning, which is not really the beginning, but I would say that it is the time where the continent completely changed from mostly desert to vegetated area. And in your mind, you get the idea of the Cambrian, the Cambrian evolution. But in fact, if you looked, the lapse of time during which the vegetation diversifies, it's not only a spread of vegetation, it's not a spread of shallow rooted plants, vascular plants, it's a spread and a diversification. And so we work on that uh, mainly uh, through a project I had several years ago, driven by Guillaume Luria, who has a poster here, and we begin to work on the Devonian, and our first methodological approach was to work with people on the plants so that they can give us uh, the, the characteristics of this plant. 
And you see on this picture at the bottom the, some pictures that Brigitte Mayer Berto gave me. So during this project, we work a lot with her to characterize different PF, PFT. In fact, there are three PFT. So what we did in our methodological approach, what Guillaume did, he used a climate model called GeoClim. He used a combined model, which is a carbon cycle model, and he built a junior slave model, which is a kind of PFT distributions. So these PFTs are three. There is vascular plant, shallow rooted, fern, tree ferns, and at the end, wood and forest. And these are the three major steps of the development and diversification during Devonian from 450 to 375. I will come back on that. So thanks to these three models, he can compute the diversification and the spread during Devonian, and this is here. So what we did, we take into account the tectonics and Devonian and paleogeographic Devonian evolution. We take into account the CO2. Here it's very, very a correct number, but in fact it's just a, a, multiple, a multiply of a, 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 a number. So we, it's 5,000 ppm in the first phase, early Devonian, and then it drops to under 5,000 ppm and at the, at the end of the Devonian, the CO2 decreased to 2,000 ppm. This is more or less derived from data. So we take into account the paleogeography, we take into account the, the, the CO2, we drive the model, and we find the distribution of the different PFT. So the first phase is the, the, the vascular, the small vascular plants, and you see they are in the first step when you get high CO2, uh, the predominant biome, and then, with the CO2 decreasing, you get more and more uh, tree ferns, and in the last step, you see that forest and wood invaded most of the places. So this is quite uh, consistent, and this is not only, as I said, a spread, but it's also a major diversification. What is the impact of that? If you think about it, not in the same time span, because this, as you see, takes tens of millions of years, but it is exactly the contrary that we are doing in terms of it is a massive CO2 relocation. So CO2 that were before in two reservoirs, atmosphere and ocean, get a new reservoir, which is terrestrial biosphere, and due to that, you get a large, large decrease of the CO2, which is recorded in the data and reconstructions. So now the paradox is the following. Today we are extracting from fossil fuel putting in the atmosphere a large quantity of CO2 very, very rapidly. At this time, we do the same, taking more time, but anyway, from a physical point of view, what you should see is a decrease of temperature. And if you look to the record, what you see is, in fact, no decrease, no major decrease of temperature at the same period of the Earth was greening. So this could be a paradox if you understand it in comparison with today. But in fact, it can be easily understood, and this is a work of Guillaume in his EPSL paper. You go from a yellow earth to a green earth, and due to that, you change drastically the albedo of the earth, at least, at least the continental earth. And this counteracts the CO2 decrease because it warms the, the planet. And due to this two effect, we can explain this paradox. So this certainly is a very important period, the Devonian, to understand many things. The, the, the rapidity of the diversification, its impact on, plim on climate, and the way there is, as I will, see, I will show later, some interaction between the leaf and the climate, the CO2 and the water vapor. There is a kind of equilibrium that makes the evolution evolved, and at the end of this period, around 380 million years, it's done, mostly. Okay, so it's quite rapid diversification. I want to speak also about another spread, which is also another diversification, and this will be more explicitly and better explained in the talk of Pierre. And this is an angiosperm spread, and this is a, a slide that I take from, from Hugo in the naturepunk.com paper. And, uh, 
And this explains what happens during this period of early Cretaceous, when certainly due to change in the drought and the dryness of the climate, angiosperms, which were more adapted to this kind of climate, due to their densities as products, or everything was possible to, to use water and CO2 in a context of decreased CO2 to adapt. And this plot from Hugo show first that the, the angiosperm very fastly developed, uh, 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 discarding all the other species, and it's a really a, a, a large, large shift. That's what you see on the plot number A. I will not go into the detail of everything on the plot B, you can see that whatever you take into account at weathering, volcanism, and changing in geology, you will have a large decrease of CO2. And this change in environment, CO2 and climate, will change the possibility for the leaf to have a density and an aperture, an, an aperture of the stomach which will regulate this new condition. And this is also very important. Okay, now I, I will go to Another talk, which will be the France Lanor instead of Gallier, and this is another very interesting revolution. It is the fact that due to changes in climate and CO2 once more, the, the biology will invent a new photosynthesis in terms of, 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 of main photosynthesis. So before the synthesis was done with C3 photosynthesis and at the Myosin Pliocene, this changed drastically with the appearance of C4. And C4 correspond all again to a wonderful adaptation to different conditions. I think uh, 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 Franz Lanon will show you that with record from the Bengal fan. Okay. And now we are going to the human. And I think it's quite interesting to understand what was the vegetation, what was the constraint in terms of climate and CO2 at the end of the Tortonian when the Tetis shrinkage was completely finished and the Sarah and Set begin, and the, and the hominids as Tumai emerged in an Africa which was mostly arid with very important wet phases, and Kami will talk about that. A second, second talk that will not be in this session but you can see tomorrow, which is a counterpart of Kami's talk on the Homo sapiens distribution, the last hundred kilo years, 130 kilo years, would be given in his medal told by Timmerman tomorrow, so you, so you can go there. But the, the very important thing also concerning this period, which are more narrow and more constrained, is what Brofkin and Kaplan will show you, that you can go to transient simulation, you can do a, a dynamics vegetation for this period. And so you can understand and modify and made transient experiment, as uh, Brofkin will show, between climate and carbon, to be able to understand what was happening during Olsen or what was happening, as Kaplan will show, during last quaternary. I go now to the end of the session. There is these processes I told you about concerning deep time and time where you get some time to make some equilibrium, even if I show you that the spread and the transformation from C3, C4 were in fact quite fast at geological time scale. So now I show you some processes of adaptation and optimization, and once again I take a, a figure from Hugo in another paper in NAST, where he described the, the fact how this, how this happened, how this optimization and adaptation of the different parameters of the leaf, the density, the sporal aperture, the stomatal conductance, all this, how they move and they adapt to the CO2 and the water vapors. And this is a quite amazing thing that show the intrinsic relationships between terrestrial biosphere and changes in climate. And this goes in this direction. You can also think about more and more a short-term interaction, and I think Jolie will talk about that in his talk, about the, the instantaneous relationships between uh, evap evapotranspiration and cloud, and how, in fact, biosphere can have an important impact via hydrological cycle on cloud and to, to be inside the system also as a rapid component. Okay, now I have 
mostly finished uh, this uh, introduction. I want to come back to that, and this is also to introduce uh, the Gregory uh, Duvillier talk on satellite. <laughs> I will not surprise anyone here to say that we are entering in a new era where we change our climate and environment so fast that it will raise some problems for sure and that it's very important to understand and control what we are doing. And we have the capability to do that, and I think Gregory will show you satellite data that allows us to do that. So we get both. We get the capability to modify drastically our environments, but if we want, if we decide that it is something very important, we can control it. And the last slide is back to Gaia, a way to understand that and a way to make a contribute to certainly Lovelock is to think about the Earth as a multi-component system. And this makes uh, changes that are sometimes proposed to put dust in the stratosphere or whatever. You have to think, or, 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 or iron in the ocean, you have to think, and that's, this is what scientists mostly did, we have to think of the Earth as a whole, and we have to investigate and to explore all the relationship and all the interaction to be sure what we are doing. And I think, myself, that the best to do is certainly to attenuate the CO2 increase in the atmosphere. So with that, I leave you for the introduction, if you have any question, and then I will come back to uh, say some a few words and a few take home message from Yves Goderis. Thank you very much. So, unfortunately, Yves Goderis was not able to come. And uh, for me, uh, <laughs> Yves Goderis is uh, a very good carbon scientist. He, he, we worked with him for more, more than 20 years with Yannick and other people here in the room on the links between tectonics, climate, CO2. And I think Pierre will show some slide about that. So I thought that Yves was the best guy to, to show what was the earth without vegetation and how this can change, and if this change was transient or not. Uh, and so I will try to give you three take-home messages that he sent me yesterday. So it's only three slides. I'm not an expert to answer the question. I can try. Maybe there are people in the room, but I can show you what are the major ideas that Eve, if, if he could attend the session, would have said. So the first take-home message is the following. The blue curves is the Foster 2016. And you can see here the evolution of the CO2 during the Phanerozoic. It's a kind of revival of burner, but uh, uh, I think with some amelioration. And, and, okay, and you can see here what is the important thing for, for Eve is to say, you see the, 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 the spread I told you about during the Devonian, and you, you see the impact on the CO2. It's a clear decrease of CO2 without major changes in temperature, as I show you. And what Yves said is that we know from the publication of Davis 2013 that this is finished about 380 million years before present. Okay. But the most important glaciation occurs 50 million years ago. So it cannot be that that makes the glaciation happen. But what if we want to say that it produces a framework, an important decrease of the CO2 that will allow, make the framework form a glaciation later. But it's not the trigger of the glaciation in terms of real trigger. So this is the first method. The second is a he wants me to explain the methodology they used. So Eve has always worked with different people in the frontier of climate, with uh, Yannick Donadieu, Guillaume Leir, myself, and many people, to try to have a good climate model and to make interaction with other box. So here I present you the methodology he used for the result. I will show you on the third slide. 
So the idea is to use a geochemical model for, water, for, for carbon cycle, and this is one box model with 11 levels, with many things inside, and is interacting with the, with the, with the global climate model through CO2 exchanges on one side, and through runoff and temperature on the other side. So these two boxes speak together, and from that you are able to know something about the climate and the CO2. We use this approach many, many times, especially for the snowball earth, where vegetation was not so important. The third box is to infer the soil and the, 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 the way the soil will develop, and this also uh, gets as an input the runoff from this model, and from that, if is able to simulate what will happen when the vegetation will colonize the earth. So his idea is to use um, an automat for producing vegetation within only three million of years and to, to try to guess what is it changing in the CO2. Is it a transient changes from one stable state to another, including now the vegetation? Is it something which is completely irreversible? Is it something that takes time and isn't it other feedback on large time scale that a little bit inhibits the decrease of the CO2? So he ran the model I just present you, and here are four maps. This is a transient experiment <clears throat> where the, the automat put vascular, vascular plants little, little by little everywhere, and this is what it produced in terms of carbon cycle. So you see four maps. The first is 0 0.15 million years. It's snapshot at 0 0.15 million years. A snapshot at 0 0.5 million years. A snapshot at 0 0.85 million years. And a snapshot at 15 million years. And the brown is increase, and the blue is the decrease. And what you see is that the fact that the vegetation spread in terms of vascular plants has a major effect at the beginning. For the last first million of years, you see a large increase of brown area. That means a large decrease of CO2. But after that, you get a reverse. And if you wait so long as 15 million years, you begin to see some reverse. Why? You see that because when you decrease the CO2, of course, it is cooler. And when it is cooler, you limit the erosion and the weathering. So this is a clear, direct impact of decreased CO2. The other thing is that you increase the soil the, the, and the regulate, and therefore you decrease erosion and weathering. And so these are prelimi preliminary results, but the idea of Eve is to say that when the vegetation comes, she, of course, redistributes the reservoir of CO2, but much more in a transient way that takes time and we have to take into account long processes to see the final state. And this includes the deepening of the regolith and the deepening of the depths of the soil and the changes produced by the CO2 decrease on temperature. So I did my best to give you the take home message from Eve. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Gilles, for the introduction. Uh, for the sake of time, I think we should move to the next speaker. Welcome, uh, Son Kassel, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much um, for the organizers to invite an extreme shallow time person like me to um, this, this conference. Um, are we talking about terrestrial carbon cycle nitrogen interactions? Um, I list my courses and the people that I've been just cutting with over time um, on this project. Um, let me start by just introducing or, or reminding us that uh, the role of nitrogen has in the biosphere is that it's contained in enzymes and everything that's going on in biochemical reactions is sort of then related to the amount of enzymes we have, which means that instantaneously, if you look at a tissue, um, the rate of a particular process, in this case this is photosynthesis, does correlate with foliar nitrogen in this case. So at an instantaneous rate, we find a correlation between biochemical activity and nitrogen concentration. Now, if you square that with the fact that nitrogen in the terrestrial biosphere comes at a cost, because either you have to grow roots to take it up and you don't have that carbon to intercept light, 
or you have to fix the car, uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is also comes with high energy costs. Uh, this all affects canopy, uh, community composition, leaf area, and that's ecosystem fluxes. And as a result, if you put this all together in a process-based ecosystem model and let um, a, in a system evolve either with knowing the nitrogen constraints or not knowing the nitrogen constraints, you typically come up with a map like this, which shows that in certain parts of the world, mostly the boreal zone, you find reduced productions if you account for the fact that you need to buy the nitrogen from the solar, from the atmosphere. Um, that's just a reminder, really. What I want to talk about is what this means in terms of transient behavior of the system. And what we see here is a sketch diagram of the calm cycle, which is very much a linear thing. You've got atmospheric CO2 that's taken up by the vegetation. It cycles through the soil and is returned to CO2. And that's very much different from the nitrogen cycle, where there's a strong interaction between the soil and the vegetation pools. And much of the nitrogen uptake of vegetation actually comes from the soil pool. Now there are two other things. There's this nitrogen uptake from the atmosphere through fixation, but that's a very small flux. And different also to the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle is leaky. There's certain pathways by which nitrogen escapes soil microorganisms and vegetation and gets lost either back to the atmosphere or it's washed to the ocean, therefore lost by the, by the biosphere. So what we have is we've got a system where the carbon nitrogen cycle are coupled through biochemistry, um, but that stoichiometry isn't necessarily completely fixed. There's a certain degree of leakiness because the nitrogen cycle loses a certain fraction of nitrogen. And we've got very low rates of input of nitrogen from the atmosphere. And this means that on different timescales, the nitrogen cycle will react differently from the calm cycle. And the question is, what does that mean for the Earth system, or at least the Treasury biosphere? Um, I'll start off, again, I'm sorry, extreme shallow time. This is internal variability. What we're looking at is the net land atmosphere carbon exchange for the period 1988 to 2002. Uh, the gray bar is what you see from the observations if you use atmospheric observations and atmospheric transport. Uh, the black line is a simulation that accounts for carbon nitrogen interactions, whereas the dotted line is again a model by that time I've given the nitrogen that the plant wants to have at any point in time. And what you see is there's hardly any difference. So at the time scale of internal variability, where we talk just about minor modifications of temperature or precipitation, um, the degree of stoichiometric flexibility in the tissues and the plants, and the fact that plants and also soil microbes have a certain ability to store nitrogen of, in good years and use it in bad years, means that on the larger scale, in, internally, we actually don't see a very strong effect, even though there's a biochemical control of nitrogen. Now the question is, does that persist in longer term times? Uh, and I now show um, examples from simulations at a single point where we looked into increasing CO2, now not in a very smooth way, but in a step way. It dumped up CO2 by 200 ppm, and those are the solid lines, and what you see is the growth response of plants. And what you see is a, a locked time scale here because I want to focus on what happens in a longer time scale. So immediately, if you turn up CO2, you see a low response of the system to elevated CO2 because the nitrogen constraints don't allow for a substantial amount in NPP increase. But you see that that is progressively relaxed over time um, and then goes into the NPP response that you would have expected from a very slow increase in, uh, in CO2. Uh, what happens here is that we increase carbon intake, which then means that more of the nitrogen will be taken up and cycle through the vegetation and soil system. Because the soil system has a very long turnover time, increasing CO2 at this time scale means that nitrogen gets stuck in the soil. We cause, cause something which is progressive nitrogen limitation. But what this graph clearly shows is that over the time scale of about 100 years, the, chain, the, the leakiness of the system and the fact that nitrogen fixation can increase over time means that gradually that instantaneous nitrogen limitation is removed. So these small fluxes, which don't seem to matter on the internal time scale, actually do have quite a long effect if we talk about decadal time scale um, simulations. The question is, this is a side scale simulation, does that matter on the global scale? Um, what I show here are two simulations now into the future. Now we're talking about decadal to centennial timescales. 
Um, these are RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 in terms of atmospheric CO2 concentration. Uh, and the simulations I saw on the right-hand side, they also account for climatic change. And what you can see is that this nitrogen limitation of the terrestrial carbon uptake does persist over longer time scales on the global scale. And you see it's somewhat dependent on the amount of forcing that you apply. If you increase CO2 at a lower rate, the nitrogen limitation is less than if you increase it at a very rapid rate. And this is because there is stoichiometric flexibility and fixation can increase and end losses can be reduced, but the amount of change that we put into the system is stronger than what the system can cope with. So the fact is there is transient nitrogen limitation of carbon uptake on decadal timescales in the system if you hit the system hard. Now the question is, and this is why I'm talking here in, in this session, is um, what happens at longer timescales? And what I've done here is I've used the trace forcing data set. So that's a climate simulation that spans two, two, uh, 22K to present day. Um, annual climate forcing, um, you see here the CO2 increase and the temperature increase. And um, I've then simulated carbon nitrogen dynamics using a comprehensive carbon nitrogen cycle model that has dynamic vegetation, fire, and other disturbances. Um, and uh, what I show here is first order simply only the net primary production. Uh, what you can see is that there's a slight decline in NPP already in the LGM conditions. That goes to what I've shown initially is that there's, because of the cost of nitrogen acquisition, even in equilibrium, some form of reduction of productivity. What's more interesting is then, is that as CO2 and temperature change over the transition, you see a widening of the gap between the two. Um, that is something I would not have necessarily expected because we're talking about here about a time scale where you think that nitrogen fixation and changes in nitrogen losses would actually compensate for the increase of production. So the fact that this nitrogen limitation persists is interesting and I want to look uh, a bit more closely into what happens. And let me start with looking again at one particular site because then it's easier to explain what's going on. What you see here is the carbon in vegetation and soil, as well as the productivity of vegetation and nitrogen fixation, um, over the time when this particular space in central Sweden becomes ice-free and the climate conditions become favorable for um, vegetation growth. The blue line here is a simulation where there's no nitrogen constraints, where the red line is one where you explicitly take account of the fact that nit plants have to acquire nitrogen either by taking it up from the soil or by fixing it. Now, if we start from bare soil, obviously there's no nitrogen in the soil, and it does take some time to develop the sufficient amount of soil carbon and soil nitrogen. And that is a time scale that is a couple of thousands of years. So this is nothing that just snap goes on, climate conditions become favorable um, as a carbon cycle model would predict. So within a couple of years, basically, the carbon cycle model would allow the plants to invade that space, and then you would have a fairly substantial production ever on. But this implies nitrogen fixation rates that are basically implausible because they are much more than, I think, have been ever observed for about a thousand of years. Um, what you then see is that even when we, after a couple of thousand, uh, thousands of years, reach sort of steady state conditions, you see still that there's a difference between the carbon and the carbon nitrogen cycle version which has to do with the fact that you need to buy this nitrogen from the soil and invest carbon either into roots or into um, fixation, and that means some of the production is forego. If we look at that now at the continental scale, at a latitudinal gradient, what this means is that as we go from LGM to present day, um, there's an increasing difference in vegetation carbon storage in the northern hemisphere, but have a careful look here in the temperate zone where we see during the transition a phase where there's increasing difference between the carbon um, uh, of the effect of the nitrogen limitation, but this goes away later on. So in some parts of the system that are significantly warm enough to allow for a lot of fixation, you see that this nitrogen effect is a transient phenomenon. It's maybe better to see down here where we look at the change of the pools. We've got a phase here where there's progressive nitrogen limitation of the carbon uptake, 
And there's a second phase where this is then released, so the system basically gradually keeps up with what a climate cycle simulation would have predicted. Um, but if we go to the boreal zone, which is colder, and where therefore nitrogen fixation is much more costly, um, this does not happen, at least not on the type scale of a couple of thousand years, which means even though the system in principle has the uh, ability to adjust, uh, it does not do that on the time scale of even a couple of millennia. Um, let's look a bit more into the nitrogen fluxes that are associated with this over time. Above here, this is the graphic that I've already shown. That's the net primary production as it progresses over time. Um, and what I show here now in green in the middle is the change of nitrogen uptake associated with this change in production. And you see a dramatic rise in nitrogen uptake for the nitrogen-limited version, which are always the lighter lines, but you see a much stronger increase in nitrogen uptake in the version that does not know about nitrogen constraints. But it's still, because of mass balance, I can calculate that uptake. Um, and it is due to an increase in nitrogen fixation that's much larger than, in the, um, in the, than simulated by the version that conserves the nitrogen budget in total. Um, is there any way we could constrain this? Well, um, I told you before that the nitrogen cycle is leaky, so it's le losing nitrogen either to the ocean or to the atmosphere, and part of the flux is nitrogen uh, uh, nitrous oxide. Um, so uh, what you see here below is the predicted N2O flux to the atmosphere as it changes over time from the LGM to the present day, and you basically see there's a slight increase in um, N2O emissions from the terrestrial biosphere during the transition. Um, you see, obviously, also some temperature-related short-term anomalies. Um, what you can do is you can take these um, fluxes and back-calculate what this means in terms of an atmospheric N2O, assuming ocean fluxes haven't changed, assuming um, stratospheric decomposition hasn't changed. And what you then see is... Um, a difference in um, the implied change in atmospheric N2O between um, the LGM and present day that is about 20 ppb higher if you assume there would be no nitrogen cycle constraints. Uh, now, I don't know the ice core records well enough, but I think that is something that one can actually look at and try to see whether that offers some constraint of what the nitrogen cycle does and then also what, how realistic those implications um, that I've shown are. To sum this up, um, CN interactions shape current biogeochemical fluxes because they instantaneously they depend on nitrogen, but the effect on the, in, on the internal variability is small, and that is why calm cycle models get, a, get away usually by predicting present-day fluxes quite well. Uh, there's a, the main effect is a strong perturbation response either to CO2 or attenuation of climate change, and that legacy effect may persist for decades, but I've shown in situations where um, soil development is involved, this can even be much longer and even on the time scale of millennia. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the interesting work on uh, nutrients and showing how important nutrients are for uh, plants to conquer the earth. I think we have time for a few questions, so if you have any questions, please. Yes? Uh, yeah, I didn't talk about nitrogen deposition for a purpose, obviously. Um, so, for one, we don't actually quite well understand nitrogen deposition from LGM to present day, so I kept it fixed, and there's an uncertainty here. For the future, um, the RCP scenarios do give us um, an increase in end deposition, depending on the assumptions made about these scenarios. Um, but all of the RCP scenarios have been extremely conservative in that air pollution measures would be taking place. So basically, they all foresee a more or less stabilization of the nitrogen deposition fluxes. But it changes between ammonium and, um, and nitrate, so oxidized and reduced emissions. So that's the difference. And it will be different in the next set of simulations because there, um, the scenarios will be more diverse in terms of nitrogen deposition. Yes? Yes, I mean, the, the problem I've shown is adding one degree of complexity. If you do that, there's another complexity, which is phosphorus. You might as well say molybdenum. Um, that is true, um, and I don't currently know what the effect will be. I mean, that's something that 
would be to need to be the next step, basically, in looking to that. Certainly, phosphorus availability means that you can't increase nitrogen fixation forever. Um, yeah. So, thank you very much. Uh, one quick question, maybe? Yes? Both. Yeah, so um, what I haven't shown because I was only given 12 minutes um, is I've got various variants of how you model bionitric nitrogen fixation. And yes, that does make actually the difference. So you can, if, when I show the, the future scenarios, your assumptions about nitrogen fixation are the key determinant about how strongly the nitrogen limitation will be. And our handle of asymbiotic nitrogen fixation is something that is not very good. So thank you very much. For the sake of time, I would like to... Uh, invite the next speaker and I'm happy to continue the discussion during the coffee break. So, Pierre, welcome. First, I would like to thank the conveners for inviting me uh, to give a talk here. Uh, as Gilles uh, said, uh, Hugo's uh, visit at the lab was really inspiring, and, um, so, um, and uh, yeah, gave new ideas. And also, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors, Anne-Claire, Yannick, uh, Alain, and Jean-Baptiste, without who um, uh, these results uh, would uh, have been uh, barely impossible uh, to get. Um, I just need to learn how to switch the, to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk about angiosperms uh, and, uh, and the Cretaceous and trying to convince you that it's a perfect laboratory to study uh, um, long-term um, interactions between vegetation and climate. Uh, if you look at present-day um, diversity of vascular plants, um, there are over a thousand species of uh, gymnosperms uh, over 10,000 uh, of species of uh, ferns, and uh, angiosperms, there are more than, uh, or, I mean, almost uh, 300,000 species. So, so they are clearly the dominant clade of uh, present-day vegetation. Um, the thing is that uh, if you look at the fossil record, um, there are two really important um, um, information. Is that The first one is that angiosperms um, diversified quite late uh, in the geological history, uh, more than 300 million years uh, after the arrival of vascular plants uh, over the continents. And uh, they diversify really quick, uh, within a tenth of uh, millions of years uh, within the Cretaceous. Uh, so that's, that is showed by the, the fossil record and the spe species diversity evolution uh, through time. Um, the thing is also that uh, this uh, dispersal, at least in the fossil record, uh, occurred uh, within a changing framework in, term of, in terms of uh, paleogeography. So one needs to quantify uh, these changes in paleogeography and climate and to quantify the um, environmental uh, settings in which this diversification occurred. Um, just a quick reminder, these questions have been uh, uh, asked for a really long time. I would say that uh, since the plate tectonics uh, concepts have been accepted by the geoscience community. Uh, a good example of that is a, is a famous paper by uh, um, Axel Rod in, in the, back in, in, the, in the 60s asking uh, uh, what is the impact of paleogeography on, on angiosperms diversification. Um, so how to quantify the, these first order links between uh, tectonics, climate and vegetation through that, the, the um, the, the Mesozoic, uh, well, we, we did that with, um, with uh, the foam um, uh, coupled uh, GCM uh, a few years ago. Uh, so foam is using um, previous versions of uh, the ocean and atmospheric component of uh, the CCSM uh, um, climate model. And we used foam enforced by five uh, paleogeographic con configurations representing uh, the Mesozoic uh, fragmentation of the, of the Pangaea. Uh, so 
225, 180, uh, 120, uh, 95 and six, uh, 70 uh, million years old. The three last uh, represent the Cretaceous changes in paleogeography and are constrained by uh, the seawall uh, paper providing uh, boundary conditions for the, for the Cretaceous. And as the atmospheric CO2 is not well constrained uh, for, the, for, the, for the Mesozoic, we used uh, three uh, atmospheric CO2 scenarios ranging from two times to eight times uh, uh, pre-industrial values. To summarize uh, these uh, numerical uh, simulations, we can just plot the continental rainfall uh, versus the, the temperature uh, at the global scale uh, for the different, uh, for the different um, CO2 uh, scenarios and, uh, and the different paleogeographies. And what you see on this plot is that no matter uh, the, the CO2 concentration applied, um, there is always an increase in rainfall uh, through time linked to the changes in paleogeography. Uh, the, the, the CO2 will just offset the, the changes in temperature uh, through time. Um, how do we explain that? Uh, well, uh, the thing is that um, what changes throughout the Mesozoic when you change the paleogeography is that you are, frac uh, you are fractionating the, the continents, you are building smaller continents and uh, uh, increasing moisture transport and um, convective precipitation. Um, the second point is that uh, for the, the early stages of, uh, of, the, of the Mesozoic, you have larger continents that are also located uh, under the descending branch of the Adli cell, and so making big arid belts um, uh, over the continents. Um, these maps uh, show the, uh, the, bi the biome classification that we applied uh, with the LPJ outputs uh, from our simulations. And when you relocate the fossil record on these maps, especially uh, for the, the, the Cretaceous, the Aptians in the Mayan and Maastrician, what you see is that the, the, the dispersal of, of the angiosperms that I was talking about seems to occur in rather temperate um, areas uh, in the mid-latitudes. Um, so this provides a kind of an environmental context for this dispersal. And the second thing is that we totally dis by destroying totally these arid belts, we might uh, um, provide some good um, conditions for this puzzle. Uh, that's really positive, but that's uh, an environmental context that we can provide with, uh, with GCMs. Um, but what this um, kind of study totally lack and missing is the reduction of vegetation on the climate. So. Um, just to summarize, the vegetation can act on, on, the, on, the, on the climate system through the albedo effect, especially in the high latitudes where the, the vegetation can, uh, can act as a mask to the, the snow albedo, and uh, also through latent heat fluxes, uh, especially in the low latitudes, uh, where many studies have, show, have showed that the, the vegetation can, uh, by increasing the evapotranspiration and latent heat fluxes, can cool the climate. Um, Such, um, such par parameters and mechanisms have been assessed in the past. For example, this, there was this pioneer paper by uh, Betty Otto and, uh, and Upchurch uh, back in the, in the late 90s, where they used uh, an atmospheric model uh, uh, together with a really simple ocean model um, in which they either release the vegetation or uh, use bare, bare, bare soil vegetation. And what this, they show is that the increase of uh, forest in the high latitudes tend to warm the climate. And this warming can, can reach up, uh, 2.5 uh, degrees. Uh, um, but as I said, uh, the, the ocean state was not really taken into to account in, the, in these kind of studies. And the ocean uh, can also have some feedbacks with the atmosphere through the fresh, fresh water discharge change, sea ice feedbacks or wind stress changes. And recent, more recent studies have, have shown that uh, I just cite a few of them. Uh, there's a paper in GRL by uh, Victor Bovkin uh, and collaborators in 2009 uh, showing uh, that the, if you replace the pre-industrial uh, vege vegetation by either a forest or a desert, it will cool or warm the climate, but also changes the precipitation patterns over the continent and the ocean that involves uh, some changes uh, in the, in the uh, ocean circulation. Um, the, um, 
More recently, a paper by Zhu and collaborators with Chris Paulson used the, um, the CCSM model, a uh, CCSM3, sorry, model um, with a Cretaceous um, configuration and showed that uh, if you change the vegetation uh, boundary conditions, you will also uh, change the, the global overturning of the, the ocean circulation. Um, a last example is the, the work by Alcama et al. in Climate Dynamics 2012 for the LGM. They changed the vegetation, turned it to a desert, and, and saw a mass, massive cooling of the, of the climate system. What we are doing uh, uh, at our lab now is using the, uh, the, the IPSL CM582 uh, model, which is a kind of new version of the, 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 the IPSL model used in the semi 5 experiments. And uh, so it includes the continual uh, surface processes with the model orchidae with 13 PFTs. Um, and we uh, tried to assess the impact of vegetation during the Cretaceous on the climate system. So we took a uh, paleogeography from seawall at, uh, around representing the Aptian Albion transition. I took a scenario at, uh, at 4x um, pre industrial values, reduced the insulation, and um, built uh, three vegetation scenarios. One is a desert uh, earth, I would say, where, where all the BFTs are set to bear soil and the soil albedo is uh, around 0.23. And two other scenarios are zonal vegetation, where basically the vegetation is evolving through the latitudinal gradient from tropical uh, at the equator to temperate and boreal at the, at the high latitudes. And the third scenario in which we, the vegetation was derived uh, from the seawall data. Uh, the seawall uh, uh, paper um, uh, provide some biomes for this period. Uh, these biomes have been, uh, have been uh, computed and translated in terms of plant functional times uh, by ourselves. Basically, it's a combination of, uh, of different plant functional times, modern plant functional types. So what these simulations show were, uh, first, the desert earth simulation uh, show a kind of runaway cooling uh, you see that this simulation is far from being stabilized. We, are, we have more than 1,500 years and the, the climate is still cooling. And this cooling is interpreted in, in, in terms of a, a big uh, feedback of the snow albedo in the high latitudes. And um, what, it, it seems surprising that you maintain snow at high latitudes in the Cretaceous, but in this uh, peculiar um, paleogeography config, configuration, you have high altitudes quite uh, north, and um, snow is maintained with the high albedo of the desert, and, uh, and the global cl climate is cooling. Now, if you, take into, uh, if we, if you look at the, the two other simulations with a uh, different vegetation, this seems to stabilize uh, to uh, more Cretaceous-like uh, global temperatures, uh, but st still, it is unknown if they will reach the same equilibri equilibrium. Quickly comparing them, the seawall vegetation uh, simulation uh, versus the, the zonal vegetation, you see strong st changes in, in, a, in, a, in two meter air temperature. The changes in, around the equator can be explained by the processes uh, linking the latent effluxes. The seawall vegetation is, um, um, is uh, less tropical than the zonal um, vegetation that we have prescribed. And uh, so the lat latent heat flux are, are smaller and, and, and the climate is warmer over these, these areas. Um, that is shown in the evaporation uh, patterns. The thing is that um, there are also big changes in, in, in the rainfall, uh, if you compute the rainfall uh, anomalies between the two uh, simulations. And um, these uh, anomalies are not only on the continent, but also over the ocean. Um, last uh, analysis that you can make is the changes in, in the moisture transport integrated uh, over the entire atmospheric column. And you see that you are strongly changing the, changing the atmospheric dynamics just by changing the, the vegetation parameters and creating a kind of monsoon-like uh, circulation over the East Asia in, par in, par in, in particular. So that is my last slide. And I'm finishing with uh, one of Hugo's uh, picture. Um, I think um, what Hugo showed uh, and that what the fossil record show is that the, the vegetation at the time of the Cretaceous transition uh, uh, knew a big, uh, big change, especially in terms of stomatal conductance. We have a change in, in leaves morphology, and the stomatal conductance is, uh, has, has been changing a lot uh, through the Cretaceous. 
And stomatal conductance is one of the things which is highly parameterized in the, in the vegetation model uh, we are using in, in GCMs. And um, I think it's time to, uh, to work a bit on the, on the deep time, uh, plane functional type, reparameterize uh, these plane, func plane functional type to account for these uh, changes in, a, in, a, in stomatal conductance <laughs> that in turn will change the evapor evapotranspiration and the, and the water cycle of the, of the climate system. Thank you. It's been long. So thank you very much for this uh, very interesting work yeah. showing the model results of the deep time. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a quick question. Yes. If I get it well, the question is that does the late Cretaceous woodland work like today's, right? Yeah, because mm. basically, according to the fossil record, most of the forest back then, you know, the ACA pound problems and things like that, which is pound dominated forest as opposed to big tree dominated forest. No, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a really important question. I think the, most studies show that um, during at least uh, a third or half of the Cretaceous, the, the angiosperms were mostly bushes or, or small, or at least small trees. So it's, it's, it's very likely that, that like the tropical ecosystems were quite different from today's. Um, how do we account uh, for that in the models is a, is a tricky question. Especially if you are in... So I have opened the, the, the discussion to, to the latent heat flux with the stomatal conductance, but I think... Um, also, we would need some constraints on the albedo um, of these uh, past ecosystems. And uh, I don't know if you... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to invite the next speaker, Alain Frank. University of Bordeaux. Thank you. So, well, do I change this? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, uh, Gilles, for the invitation. And this will be um, a sort of follow-up of this common work with, uh, with Pierre and focusing on a dedicated family of the palms. Uh, so, in fact, um, this uh, coevolution or interaction between uh, biosphere on one hand and uh, the physical, chemical physical aspects of the Earth system are really have been co-evolving for billions of years, and of course not only because of climate and vegetation. Now, this is a kind of paper by Lenton about uh, more than 10 years ago, and there has always been feedbacks between biosphere and lithosphere, and lithosphere and biosphere, or, and the atmosphere, of course. This is really something quite uh, usual for the Earth's dynamics. Uh, this is an old connection between climate and vegetation over one century old, so-called bioclimatic conditions, which uh, describes the climate to which some type of vegetation are adapted. And one question is how does climate and physics and chemistry drive the, 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 the functional of the vegetation? Another question is what is the relationship between diversification and climatic conditions? So this is starting point, this common work with uh, Gilles, Pierre, uh, Anne-Claire, and Yannick, and uh, Pierre has explained to you. Uh, these are the bioclimatic conditions, Köppen's conditions, over times, where you can see those are real belts, and uh, this is what we have worked with. And this is another view on this, because the question is how do vegetation adapt to climatic conditions? And when there is a change, like nowadays, for example, they may either adapt locally or migrate to other locations where the climate is as it uh, in next time as it has been in the past for them. And there has been a very well-known um, route 
Uh, it doesn't work. And on the top, uh, on Eocene, a, a very well-known route on, for temperate conditions between Eurasia and uh, Northern America, of course. And there is an, another less known but as important route between in Gond former Gondwana between South America, uh, Australia, a little bit of Africa, over Antarctica, who until 30 million years ago was really an interpret climate. <clears throat> so we will focus on palms. Uh, this is the work of Toma. Uh, he has worked, he's been working on palms with Will Baker for, for years and years. And this is uh, the area of palms here you can see. And this is just to tell you that we, in biology we focus, of course, on how do things work, of course. But we focus as well on something which is much more difficult to explain is why is there so high diversity? What are the, the drivers of diversification? And this question really seems open. We have m many information of the patterns of diversity, of course. But how does climate uh, drives, for example, diversification is something still open. Uh, what is really more or less understood is how does climate drive extinctions, but diversification is an open question. So this is a brief discussion about uh, palm family. And this is how uh, biologists describe diversity. It's just historical. It is how the, the evolution of the diversity patterns, we can, by phylogenies, infer the history of the diversification or speciation, just looking at current diversity. And we have a couple of models of molecular evolution. And when running those models, we can build those phylogeny. And this is a phylogeny of the palm families. I won't explain the names, even myself. <laughs> I do know them by heart. It's the work of uh, Bill Baker and Thomas Kuvara. So this is now how to connect climate, uh, the change, and uh, play tectonics and pattern of diversification. Of course, it's extension, colonization, and migrations. And we have uh, some type of uh, models, like this one, which has been a well-known model called Lagrange. And uh, you, to keep it short, uh, you, from one to six, you have a couple of possibilities. Time is running upwards, and each uh, time slot, you have the possibility of diversification, extension, or migration. And this is modeled as a Markov chain. Markov chains are everywhere in biology. And then, <coughs> this is what people do. <coughs> they can put this model uh, running on these phylogenies. This is the work of Thomas and, ba and Will Baker, published a couple of years ago, and you see this possibility of um, connection between old, between, uh, old plates. <coughs> and here, for example, at uh, this um, Paleocene and Middle Eocene, the main things which was, could be shown was the, um, the extension of the palm from South America and expanding uh, in other continents. And next, and we have a couple of them, but this is just the second one. This is you see back and worse uh, and the diversification and migration paths. So this is what has been done by uh, Thomas and um, and um, Bill, and this is now what we will we'll do together. Uh, and this is the first step. We are just using those models made by uh, biologists like here uh, Sankov, who has modeled how um, um, a character can evolve along a phylogeny. And of course, the character we have selected is where the, clay, where the species and genera and families uh, lived. <clears throat> so I won't explain this, but uh, this, is, uh, has been, this model has been published in the 70s. It yeah, has been used thousands of times. This is more or less how it works. That, uh, this is how to connect bioclimatic maps, uh, paleoclimatic maps, uh, paleogeographic maps, and those phylogenies. Um, I'm sorry, but I cannot uh, find uh, how to show you with red dots what I am speaking. You start from the top left of data tree, what has been done for palms, and then uh, use the second part, the paleographic and paleoclimatic maps, as what has been done with uh, Gilles and Pierre team uh, a couple of years ago. And then we, we uh, start with the elementary areas where palms did, do live together or lived a couple of uh, millions of years ago. And you remember the phylogeny with those nodes and edges between a, a point of time. And then we, we know where the starting edge is and the, the starting tip is, the last, uh, the last tip is. And we can have a cost matrix, how much does it cost to migrate, how much does it cost to adapt, how much does it cost to get extinct. And um, more or less with sunk of algorithms, we can um, handle those cost matrices and uh, find what is 
the most likely state of what you call inner nodes, so, so the area of the inner nodes of the phylogeny. And this is the uh, last slide. It is not el as elaborate as a picture of a phylogenetic tree as, as the one by Thomas and, and Will, but because the calculation has been finished just a couple of weeks ago, and so way to put them into a, a flashy thing is really a lot of work as well. Uh, but this is a phylogeny of the palms that you have seen before. On the right side here, you have the names of the palms. Of course, I won't speak of this to you again. And you can see letters, and letters means either current area or combination of current areas. And you can see that F, no, you cannot see, but I tell you that F means Eurasia, because uh, there are a lot of palms in Eurasia, especially Southern Eurasia and Southeastern Eurasia. And A and B means America, either North America or South America. I mean, there is, uh, South America is currently a high diversification, diversification area for palms. And you can see that there is a connection between the history of the diversification and the location of them. And through those type of methods, it's possible to reconstruct and not only the history of the diversification, but as well the, the historical biography of those clades. And uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few questions. If you have any questions, please. I cannot, I cannot tell you for Pran specifically, but uh, a long discussion we had with Pierre is that uh, we agree, and the discussion is that uh, if you look at the history of angiosperms and many families, you cannot notice KT extinction. You don't see it. There is not a rise of extinctions in the phylogenies, and there is neither a rise of diversification just after. So most of the families of angiosperm has been established by late Cretaceous and they have survived uh, KT extinction. And most of recent diversification is really at uh, Eocene and Miocene and so on, and just, just where at, at the genus level. So we, we simply do not see it. Which is really a question. Thank you. Other questions, maybe? Yes. Yes. Uh Um, how, do, uh, how do I do it? Oh, okay, okay. This one? Uh, no, uh, the tree, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, the timing of the <laughs> points on the right side, the, can you tell me what geologic era? Oh, this is, um, yes, I should have told you, this is not um, dated. It is, you see one inch or one centimeter, it's just uh, one node in the, in the tree. And uh, this is not dated. Uh, if you want to look at, uh, at the dates, it's just here, you see here. You have the same, exactly the same tree. We have worked with the same trees. And you have here from Cretaceous to Miocene. But it is exactly the same tree. What? Okay. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is okay. Sorry. Uh, I, uh, this is Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. This is which, your question. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to invite the next speaker then, Valier Gali. Oh, sorry. Christian France Lanor. Valier Gali is not there. Okay. He will. Okay, good morning. So, uh, so uh, for those of you uh, looking for Valier Gali, this is the, the guy. <laughs> and I'm obviously not him. Uh, but I'm Christian France Lanor. Uh, uh, and I will present for him. He, he was not able to make the travel to. Uh, to uh, Europe at this time. So uh, this talk will be uh, about the um, expansion of C4 plants that is recorded in the uh, Indian subcontinent uh, during the Miocene and how we can document this and the environmental changes associated to the 
radiation of C4 uh, photosynthetic plants uh, from the uh, record of deposition uh, uh, during I don't know. <laughs> uh, from the record of, uh, of, of uh, um, Himalayan erosion uh, in the Bengal Fan that has been uh, uh, obtained from recent IODP uh, expedition. So uh, the C4 plant uh, uh, expansion has been very well uh, uh, illustrated by the discovery of uh, uh, Jay Quaid and, and Truri Serling in the, 80, in the late 80s uh, uh, in the uh, Siwalix of the Pakistans, which has a, a sedimentary record of deposition in the floodplain of the Western Himalaya. And this uh, uh, record uh, was showing a fantastic uh, shift in the Delta C13 of uh, pedogenic carbonates here, uh, showing uh, uh, almost a 10 per mil shift of those uh, 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 pedogenic carbonates that was reflecting the radiation of uh, or the, ch the, 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 the shift of uh, uh, C3 uh, dominated uh, or forest types of, a, of a environment and uh, uh, switching to uh, uh, C3, uh, C4 uh, savanna type of uh, environment in the uh, in this fruit plain at that uh, period. And uh, uh, later on, uh, we discovered on the uh, deep uh, Bengal fan record in the, uh, um, at the beginning of the 90s uh, that uh, from the terrestrial uh, uh, organic matter uh, that is contained on those sediments, uh, that we could uh, also uh, look at the, uh, or observe the same or a parallel shift in delta C13 directly on the, on the delta C, on the organic matter at that time, and uh, on a record that is integrating uh, a continental scale uh, watershed. So the, 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 this uh, exp expansion was really uh, uh, largely developed there, and at that time, uh, most of the hypotheses on the forcing of those. Uh, systems were turning around the uh, role of uh, falling PCO2 uh, in, the, in the system and that uh, uh, probably uh, reaching a, a threshold uh, low value of PCO2 would favor uh, the expansion of C4 plants. And the alternative uh, was to look at uh, uh, the effect of water stress and high temperature that also favor the development of C4 plants over C3. The role of uh, PCO2 became uh, weaker uh, with the discoveries of uh, uh, Pagani and, and, and co-workers on the atmospheric PCO2 sh showing that uh, very likely the, the atmospheric CO2 pressure was low since the uh, late Oligocene probably and therefore that uh, the, the CO2 was not a, 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 a real trigger uh, for the, the C4 plant expansion at that in, in the late Miocene. So uh, we were uh, living with the, uh, the role of the monsoon and uh, uh, to be frank, the, 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 the understanding on, on the evolution of the monsoon throughout this uh, period is not very clear. There are some records which shows that there is an intensification of the monsoon eight million years ago, like here on those uh, foraminifers records uh, that are representing a, a intensification of upwelling in the Arabian Sea, but otherwise looking at other records like here, dust, in aeolian dust, uh, you have uh, only a change uh, much later in, uh, in the, during the Pliocene. And so there was no uh, real uh, good record of, uh, of what is going on and uh, for the monsoon and uh, also it was not directly uh, all those records do not directly uh, uh, focus on the zone where we observe the, the, the C4 plant expansion which is more or less the uh, Indo-Gangetic uh, basin and the Sub-Himalayan sub basin. So this is uh, now obtained uh, with recent drillings uh, from IODP in the, uh, in the Bay of Bengal and looking at a, a transect, uh, we have been drilling uh, uh, throughout uh, the middle Bengal fan at the latitude of Sri Lanka 
And here you have uh, about three to four kilometers of sediments deposited by the uh, fluxes of, uh, of the Ganga and Brahmaputra, representing a, a, a record, or more or less continuous, a record of uh, uh, terrestrial uh, or detrital sediments accumulated here in, this, uh, in these basins. And uh, Expedition 354 uh, uh, drilled a series of holes uh, across this uh, fan. And we will concentrate today on the three deep holes uh, that represents uh, about uh, 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 three holes of uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, meters deep uh, that allows to have a, a, a record of uh, about 28, 25 million years of sedimentations, mostly turbiditic, as he, uh, shown here as an, an, as an example, as a succession of uh, uh, turbiditic pulses uh, of, the, of various uh, grain size from silt to sand. So uh, this is uh, uh, what we obtained on the bulk organic carbon uh, uh, of this uh, record for the last 20 million year, 25 million year here uh, uh, for the three different uh, holes uh, uh, across the Bengal fan. So we uh, more or less observe exactly the same uh, uh, response uh, through time. So uh, uh, minus 25 more or less uh, a record up to about 6 million years, 6.5 million years. Then the radiation or a shift towards high, much higher values up to 21, 20 uh, per mil. Uh, of course, this is, these are marine sediments and the, the organic matter there can be a mix of a, a, a terrestrial and a, a marine organic carbon and minus 20 is uh, absolutely typical for marine organic carbon. Uh, uh, but in fact, when looking at uh, uh, compound specifics like uh, here, uh, C33 NLKN or C28 fatty acids, we can see that those uh, uh, molecules which are uh, characteristics of terrestrial plants also show the same or the parallel shift in uh, delta C13, showing that uh, we have a change in the uh, photosynthetic system and the proportion of C3 to C4 in the in the basin, and that is the correlation between delta C13 uh, of uh, bulk delta C13 and and uh, compound specific. Uh, uh, delta C13, which shows that there is a good correspondence and that therefore uh, we uh, really document uh, a change in the uh, uh, veg uh, terrestrial vegetation here. So, in order to better characterize the, the environmental changes, uh, Valier Galli and, and Sarah Fickens uh, have been analyzing uh, the uh, delta D, so the isotopic composition of hydrogen of uh, C28 fatty acid here, uh, which is presented here. These are the black dots on this diagram. Green dots represent the delta C13 uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, C33, C uh, showing uh, once again the expansion of uh, C4 plants uh, uh, at six million years. And what we observed from the uh, delta D of the fatty acid is that there is a, 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 a shift of the delta D value from about minus 180 or 90 uh, per mil uh, before uh, 6 million year uh, to about minus uh, 180 per mil uh, uh, after. And so there is a shift of about 20 to uh, 15 uh, to 10 uh, per mil uh, uh, parallel to the expansion or the change in the flora in these uh, systems. Of course, these values are extremely depleted uh, with respect to uh, meteoric water, and there has been calibration uh, of the fractionation factors for different plant types. This is the synthesis by uh, Dirk Sachs, uh, uh, recently published, on those uh, uh, fractionation factors between, uh, biological fractionation factors between uh, plants and, uh, or different types of plants and meteoric water. And we will be using here uh, to correct this effect the uh, values obtained for uh, C4 and, and, and C3 uh, uh, forest in the, in the system. So this, is, this uh, represents, uh, uh, with the blue dots here, uh, the isotopic composition of uh, uh, precipitation deduced from the, C, uh, from the C28 fatty acids 
of, uh, across this uh, transition. So we have uh, precipitation all throughout the, uh, the Miocene uh, up to uh, about uh, uh, six million years uh, with low value around minus 80 per mil uh, and a shift towards uh, uh, heavier uh, value uh, uh, around minus 60, minus 50 per mil uh, during the Plyo and Pleistocene periods. And uh, uh, we can observe first uh, uh, that these values uh, recorded for the Plyo Pleistocene uh, mimics relatively well what we have on the modern uh, uh, river sediments uh, for present day. Uh, uh, the values are not reported here, but it's, it's ranging from typically uh, minus uh, 70 to minus 50 uh, per mil. And so that's uh, relatively uh, in good accordance of the modern values. And the second observation is that we have for the uh, Miocene period uh, a, a much lower value. Uh, much lower value uh, uh, suggests that the monsoon uh, was very uh, uh, was uh, more intense and was generating a higher amount effect in the, on the precipitation than today. And uh, uh, the fact that this is, uh, although the, there are not so many data uh, uh, right now, uh, but it, 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 re it suggests that the monsoon was indeed in intense all throughout the Miocene uh, 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 up to uh, this uh, transition of, of plants. So uh, this is uh, showing uh, the same data set uh, and showing the, 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 the parallel between uh, 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 the change in vegetation here uh, 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 by the delta C13 of uh, C28 fatty acids and the uh, change in delta D of precipitation and, and same showing low delta D precipitation before C4 plant expansion and higher uh, uh, delta D of the precipitation after the C4 plant exp uh, expansion. So uh, uh, the take home message is uh, uh, from this uh, study, uh, which is not complete now, but uh, uh, needs to, to, to be uh, looked at with some more details, but uh, already we have uh, very clear uh, implications. There is a, a straightforward uh, uh, observation that uh, C4 plant radiations uh, occur uh, across uh, uh, in, in a, a unidirectional way uh, uh, about uh, 6.5 million years ago and is well recorded in the tree. Uh, uh, holes of the of the Bengal fan. Uh, this is uh, accompanied by a, a shift in the delta D of precipitation, about 10 to 20 per mil, that uh, uh, could indicate a weakening of the uh, Indian monsoon uh, uh, during that period. And indeed, this weakening of the monsoon uh, could correspond to increased water stress. Uh, for those uh, uh, environment and could explain the uh, C4 plant uh, uh, expansion or could be a, a trigger for the C4 plant expansions. But we have to keep in mind that uh, other processes could also uh, uh, generate the same uh, effect. We have to understand better uh, the links with the provenance of the sediments uh, uh, because uh, C4 plant expansion could also generate a, a shift in the provenance of organic matter uh, from the mountain to the floodplain, for instance. And in, a, in that case, we, all, we would also observe a, a delta D uh, enrichment uh, just by uh, changing the, the provenance of the organic matter associated to the sediment. So uh, at this point, we must be uh, cautious and there is likely a uh, 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 weakening of the monsoon, but this needs to be uh, uh, further refined and, and cross-calibrated with other uh, tracers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christian. Um, we have time for a few questions, so... Uh, Yes, please. Peter. Fantastic. I just wanted to comment that actually what you just said is terrifically consistent with the uh, records we have for hematite abundance, now from the southwest South China Sea, from the Mekong, and now from the Arabian Sea, also suggesting drying about six million years ago. So you make me happy. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I saw someone wanting to ask a question here in front.
Well, there, there are several ways the, uh, to uh, test that, but uh, uh, one uh, older observations which uh, was made in the, in, the, in the first study of the Bengal fan sediments was showing that there is a link uh, there is not only a record of, of expansion of C4 plants, but there is a link between the sediment types and the sediment grain size or, or characteristics and the, del and the, the, the delta C13 and the, 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 the association with uh, more or less of uh, organic matter. So that's one, one point where we can, uh, and we are uh, looking in more detail uh, rather than the bulk uh, analysis. Uh, the other part is that uh, uh, the, the myosin record uh, of the Bengal fan has been extremely uh, uh, rich in, in plant debris uh, that we can also use uh, uh, as, a, as a discrete samples of, of organic matter rather than looking at, at uh, absolutely uh, bulk uh, organic matter. So that, these are two, two things. And also uh, um, there is a, a, a paleoclimate uh, record that is on, on its uh, way uh, of uh, ex uh, exploitation uh, that is linked to the Expedition 353 in the Bay of Bengal. And those are th this uh, or, or, this uh, expedition was much more uh, oriented towards the paleoclimatic record of the, of the monsoon and will also provide independent uh, uh, records of the monsoon from, for this uh, area. Okay, are there other questions, suggestions? Would you like to say something? Yeah, yeah I, I, first I want to thank Christian that replaced Xavier uh, Valley Gali very rapidly, and then I have a very naive question. Uh, if you go to the Bengal Fund, which is a kind of litter, it's, it's, you will bring many, many things inside this place. So as you said, the, there is many noise and it's difficult. But uh, if you just do that for the, the, the transition at mid Holocene, when the, the monsoon were changing, are you able to, to from your record in the Bengal Fund, to, to diagnose the changes in monsoon during the last... Uh, uh, mid Holocene period, for instance. Yeah, uh, well, we we didn't talk to before the the talk, so <laughs> <laughs> but, so th this this was not a, 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 a comment a question, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's an earlier uh, study by uh, uh, Valier and, and and myself on the uh, on the last uh, glacial cycle uh, to present. Uh, record in the, in the Bay of Bengal. It's a, a much more uh, to the north of the Bay of Bengal, but it's, and it's on a short core. But it's, it's showing that uh, from the last glacial maximum, we had higher uh, uh, C4 plant uh, uh, representation in the, in the sediments. Uh, uh, and that is uh, uh, returning to a, a more C3 dominated system in the, in the modern period. Uh, and uh, this is not represented on this, uh, on this uh, slide, but the delta D of the lipids is also mimicking very well this uh, change. So there is a, uh, you, could, uh, you could in a way uh, uh, make the parallel between the short term and, uh, and, uh, and the long term uh, ex uh, evolution. Okay, thank you for this uh, nice interaction. Uh, for now, I would like to conclude the morning session and thank all the speakers uh, and their, their co-authors for the contributions of, of this morning. For me, it was very nice to see such a big overview of different processes and timescales. Also, I would like to invite you back for the session after the coffee break, which starts at 10.30. There we will cover vegetation climate interactions at more recent timescales and shorter uh, timescales. So thank you very much and I hope to see you after the coffee break. Testing. Um, may I get your attention? Let's uh, start our session now. So, could you all please have a seat? So, so this morning, um, this morning we talk about deep time. From starting from Devonian and then slowly moving towards a more recent geologic timescale like um, 
myosin and pliocin. So continuing from that point, uh, we're going to talk about more of a recent geologic time scale in the second session. And then we're going to look at um, processes and how these processes, for example, um, precipitation, evaporation, how the, in terms of um, interannual and diurnal and seasonal time scale, how does it affect um, climate and its feeds back to vegetation. So, um, with that, I will like to invite um, Camille to um, start her talk on the um, more recent um, geologic time scale in terms of um, vegetation and how it affects um, our ancestor. Thank you. Well, I think I have this mic. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I will talk about uh, the African climate and vegetation at the roots of humankind during the Pliocene time period. So, uh, you will see more. Does this work? Yes. So, first of all, why do I talk about roots of humankind? Uh, because uh, the Pliocene, so the Pliocene is between five to three million years ago roughly, and uh, during that time period, there, was, uh, there were many species of Australopi Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, anamensis, and other uh, different species that are uh, relatively similar to uh, Australopithecus. And uh, these, uh, these species uh, have uh, diversified during this time period of the Pliocene, which was a warmer than present period, and which is also uh, considered as a good analog for future climate, but that's something else. Um, and at the end of this warm period of the Pliocene, uh, the northern hemisphere glaciation has taken place, uh, and it was the beginning of uh, the quaternary with the glacial interglacial cycles that started to, to happen. And after this northern hemisphere glaciation, there was the Homo species, uh, with Homo habilis uh, and later Homo uh, erectus and Homo sapiens. And there was another branch uh, of, uh, of uh, hominins that are called Paranthropus, but I won't talk about this because I focus only on the Pliocene. And uh, so during the last five million years, or five of, uh, four or five million years, there has been uh, uh, paleo, uh, paleo uh, studies of soils that have documented that uh, the vegetation and the climate in Africa uh, has become more and more arid uh, when, when coming to the present. Uh, so uh, who, where are these uh, Australopiths found? Uh, well, they've been mostly found in East Africa. I'm sorry, it's in French, but uh, it's mostly Latin names, so it will be fine. Uh, so in the Adar regions and around Lake Turkana in, Ke in Kenya. There are other uh, 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 Australopiths, uh, Australopiths uh, found in South Africa. It's another species. It's Australopithecus africanus, whereas here it's Afarensis and Anamensis. Uh, and uh, so the East Africa has been considered to be the cradle of mankind. And uh, only in the 90, 90s, uh, there have been uh, uh, Australopiths found west of the African Rift Valley uh, in the Lake Chad Basin. So uh, they've been found uh, by a French group, and I'm French, so of course I'm interested in the in these hominids. Um, and uh, what is interesting is that uh, we have the oldest hominid uh, who has been found, he's seven million years ago, uh, so during the late Miocene, it's even before the Pliocene, and also uh, uh, a species which has been attributed to Australopithecus afarensis, so the same species as in the Rift Valley, uh, uh, which is found here in the Lake Chad Basin, so in, in, center, uh, of, um, in the center of Africa. So uh, it's a bit a question, is it, uh, is it uh, normal that we found Australopiths here, 
or is it just because uh, the people who have found them ve were very lucky because uh, they were not supposed to live there, or is it uh, could we found uh, many more uh, or not? So this is a bit uh, the question here. Uh, what are the environments of these osteopaths? Uh, they they all live in an open landscape. Uh, uh, what we call a savanna, from dry savanna to wooded savanna, so this can be a very different environment if you go from a dry savanna to a wooded savanna, it's different. But in any case, they always live in an open environment that will be very different in terms of selective pressure, as uh, very different to uh, a closed forest. Here you can see a tropical forest, uh, it's really not the same thing as an open uh, woodland, or, uh, or a dry savanna. So really, uh, we can discuss about the percentage of tree cover uh, that they need, but it's always an open environment. And it's very frequently close to a lake uh, or close to freshwater sources. So the scientific questions I will uh, try to answer are, can we predict the areas where australopiths lived? Are the lake shad hominins an anomaly or not? And although uh, the osteopaths seem adapted to vast range of bioclimatic conditions, can we learn more about what they really preferred? Like dry savannas or wooded savannas. So uh, in order to answer those questions, I will use uh, modeling because I'm a paleoclimate modeler. I'm not a paleoanthropologist. So I will use uh, global climate models, vegetation models, and ecological niche models to try to, to try to respond to these questions. So first, this is a global view of the climate of the Pliocene, simulated with the French model IPSR-CM5. Uh, so it's globally a warmer climate with uh, much warmer high latitudes, smaller ice sheets, and it is before the onset of glacial interglacial cycles. So uh, climate variability is smaller than during the Quaternary. Tropical variability is controlled by precession. I'll, go, I'll explain more later. And we have a stronger, uh, stronger African monsoon and more northern uh, African monsoon and as well Indian, Indian monsoon, but I won't, I won't talk to, about India. Uh, so this is a more uh, regional view of uh, precipitation during the Pliocene uh, simulated by the model and vegetation uh, simulated uh, with the Biome 4 model. So as you can see in the Lake Chad area, it's uh, relatively dry. It's uh, more humid than today, but it's still relatively dry. In the Rift Valley, it's also dry. And in South Africa, it's a little less dry. In terms of uh, biomes, uh, all the pink that you see here is tropical xerophytic shrubland in biome 4. That means 30, more or less 20 to 30 percent tree cover, and the rest is grassland. And you can see that around Lake Chad in the Rift Valley, it's either this uh, pink cover uh, of, uh, of, let's say, dry savanna, or uh, it's tropical savanna, that means a little more tree cover. Uh, and in South Africa, it's a little bit different. It's, uh, it's even less tree cover. It's drier, actually. So it's because we don't have the same uh, temperature. Because you can see there's more precipitation. So uh, if we use this uh, simulated Pliocene climate to, uh, to simulate the probability of presence of uh, Australopiths, uh, so you can see uh, here uh, this probability uh, in red and the occurrence points of all the osteopaths. You can see that we construct a niche that covers uh, the, the Horn of Africa and that also uh, goes uh, toward Lake Chad uh, in a latitudinal uh, band uh, that uh, links Lake Chad Basin and the Hadar region. And uh, the, the probability of presence in the South Africa, in the South Africa sites is uh, relatively low compared to other sites. Um, we have given the model uh, temperature of the coldest months, temperature of the warmest months, mean annual precipitation, driest month precipitation, mean annual temperature, and uh, net primary productivity. And what it says is that the predictive variables, the 
the, the variables who are the most useful to understand the distribution of uh, the hominids are temperature of the coldest months, temperature of the warmest months, and precipitation, approximately 30% each. So the model says the driest months precipitation and mean annual temperature does not matter. This is a model result. I'm not saying this is necessarily true for hominids. Um, yeah, so this is uh, uh, a view of uh, the four uh, major predictors. So uh, temp the temperatures and precipitation are 30% each, more or less, and this is a few percent. And you can see that all the occurrence points occur, uh, I have to go faster, uh, occur in very dry areas as simulated by the model, which is not necessarily true in the data, because we know uh, in East Africa, uh, the, the climate was actually wetter than what the model simulates. So this is a bit of a problem. Uh, the first question is, can the model predict the Chadian and South African sites? Uh, so because you remember, my question was, can we predict where uh, hominins are? And the answer is yes. If we only uh, tell the model to construct the niche with the East African sites, he predicts, well, it predicts, um, uh, uh, certain uh, relatively high uh, probability of presence in the Lake Chad area and still pretty low in the, in the South Africa, but uh, there is a probability of presence. So the answer is we, have, we seem to have a relatively good predictive tool. But uh, all, I, all I presented you uh, is only uh, with uh, one view, one mean uh, climate of the Pliocene, but we know that during the Pliocene, uh, the, the tropical, uh, there was some tropical variability and it was driven by, pre by precession. Because uh, since uh, the late Miocene and the closure of the Tethys Sea, the region really answers uh, more drastically to precession changes. I don't have the time to explain. Um, so uh, if, we, if we take different uh, orbital configurations and run the, the biome model to see a little bit uh, where are the areas where we have more vegetation variability during the Pliocene, um, uh, we, can, uh, we have these uh, four snapshots. So you can see that uh, there is always a tropical forest and there is always savanna and there is always a desert. But uh, you, you can have more uh, northern, uh, uh, North, uh, North African monsoon uh, in these configurations where insulation is, uh, is more important in the northern hemisphere during summer months. Or uh, you can have a more humid uh, South Africa when insulation is uh, more Im important during winter months, northern hemisphere winter months. Um, and uh, in the chat sites, we always have dry savanna, whatever, uh, whatever the orbital configuration. In East Africa, we go from dry savanna to woodland, uh, and South Africa also from dry savanna to woodland. So, uh, uh, so there are some sites that experience more, more climate variability during the Pliocene than others. Uh, if we uh, run the ecological niche model uh, on, on, on these, uh, with, with these four simulated climates, uh, we can see that, uh, in fact, we always have a high precipitation, uh, a high uh, probability in the, in the Lake Turkana region, and uh, we have lower probabilities in all the other sites. So uh, the problem, but the problem is that we also have all the occurrence, well, a vast majority of the occurrence points in the Turkana Basin. So we cannot really know if that's um, a real signal or a sampling bias. So this is the take home messages. We have a predictive tool. Uh, the Lake Chad hominids are not an anomaly. The South African hominids seems more an anomaly, but it's also not the same species. And uh, we have uh, to understand if our, our uh, results are a real signal or if they are based on the fact that we have much more sampling in East Africa than in other areas. Thank you. Sorry for being so long. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, with that, I open the floor for any questions. Yes. Um, it's sort of a comment, really. If you think about the Holocene, the 
there's new evidence from southern Africa that suggests that the monsoon and the tangential tangents are in the phase of the northern hemisphere, which is not something we've seen any of the more simulations. If that actually operates through time, then it could be that your anomalous pattern in the South African field is not so anomalous or half thought, it's just simply you've got the wrong simulated climate. So I just think it's fun to look at that. I agree with you. <laughs> Any more question? Yes. Well, it's actually okay. Uh, it's uh, it's late Pliocene, so uh, uh, the boundary conditions are 400 ppm of CO2, uh, smaller ice sheets. That means half, you know, a third of Greenland and. Uh, and the third and attends, half of Antarctica, so smaller ice sheets. This is basically the PlyoMIP, uh, Plasin Model Inter Comparison Project of Boundary Conditions. Yeah. Okay, with that, um, I would like to invite uh, our second speaker, um, Victor Brovlin from the Max Planck Institute. Um, the floor is yours. I want first to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk and I will present results of uh, a group of more than 15 scientists which uh, are based basically in the northern Germany and we do the simulations with a highly resolved MPI Earth system model. And uh, first I want to focus why actually what's interesting in the Holocene, why we are doing this uh, Holocene simulation and in particular the carbon cycle and <coughs> the reason for that is if you look here just at the uh, Top to the left is that CO2 over the last 8,000 years was increased by probably 20 ppm, it might be less, 15 ppm. It was, so CO2 is rising by a temperature, if you believe in Marquardt reconstruction, so it was decreasing, might be it's also overdone, so it might be that it is just stayed constant, but in any case it was not increasing much over the Holocene. And that means it's uh, different from what we have during the glacial cycle when temperature and CO2 are highly coupled, and here we have decoupling and there are different hypotheses so it might be land, which is a source of carbon, including early anthropogenic land use. It could be carbonate chemistry response and can be just a number of other mechanisms. We reviewed recently about six or eight of these mechanisms for the Holocene carbon changes. And there is advantage of the Holocene because uh, data quality and quantity is much higher than for the early integrations. And uh, why to use full-scale of system models for this analysis of the Holocene? Uh, of course, we want to focus on couple climate carbon dynamics, and we want to use some geological archives for that. There was already a number of simulations we did with intermediate complexity models, but the temporal and spatial resolution is quite coarse, so that's, and variability is not re well represented. That's why we want to do it with full-scale ESMs, and of course, these models are models used for the future projections, so we can make a link between past and future. And last but not least, we can do trends in simulation now because we can do them. Because the models are becoming faster. So this model, which is in T63 resolution, it's about 1.8 uh, degrees. Uh, we run it for 8,000 years from 8K to pre-industrial in atmosphere, ocean, land, carbon setup. And the model full setup runs about 60 years a day. So it was basically half a year experiments or oh, it was several experiments we did uh, in parallel. And uh, we used, as for spin-up, we just had no better idea than just to equilibrate it with forcing at 8,000 years. And then we used forcing high orbital forcing, uh, methane and N2O from ice cores. We used volcanic eruption, solar variability. And for CO2, we did a, a bit of novel thing. We nudged it to the ice core data using ocean alkalinity because we want that CO2 follows uh, the observed trend. Otherwise, uh, our carbon cycle will be disturbed. We cannot conclude much on that. And that's what coming out of this simulation. So let me explain. So that's 8,000 years, starting from the left to the right. So this, <coughs> the red line is observed ice core data. And the magenta lines around it is simulated atmospheric CO2. So you can see that there is some variability in it. There are some jumps. Uh, but in general, we follow the observed CO2 trend. And uh, that's, if you look at the green line, this is a uh, land carbon. So we see that the land carbon is increasing. So by 
let's say, 4,000 years, we have about 60 gigaton more on land, and then it's starting slowly to decline. And then during the last 2,000 years, we definitely have a source of uh, land carbon because of land use. We were not able to capture this drop around 1,600, so I think neither of interactive carbon model can do that. And uh, for ocean, well, ocean is a CO2 source in our simulation. And what is interesting is the period of volcanic eruption. I will come uh, to that uh, in the following slides. What, we have, uh, what do we have with vegetation changes? Because we have dynamic vegetation model here. So that's comparison of 8K relative to 2K. I will take this reference because it's kind of pre-industrial, not disturbed by land use. So we get much greener Sahel Sahara, that's the changes in vegetation cover. So green here is more vegetation. Uh, well, we have changes in, you know, in uh, Central uh, North America, which was dry, and then there is less vegetation and also less trees. We have northward shift of boreal forest, I would say, Nothing unusual, but it's nice to get it with a full-scale ESM. And if you look at the distribution of, if you discretize it and use the biomes, let, uh, so here the shading is uh, in accordance with the classes and the circles are coming from the pollen database. And uh, you probably can't see much of Europe, uh, but generally if you look in the patterns, so we get the patterns in the model reasonably in line with the model data, even in the North Africa, we have just more of the uh, Sahel area and we have just expansion of uh, vegetation towards the north. And it will be, if you're interested in details, it will be talk of Martin Clausen uh, on that on Friday on North African development. If you go back to the land carbon storage, so what happened with the land carbon over the last uh, the patterns over the last 8,000 years. So here, just to confuse you, I pick up uh, 2,000 years ago as a reference period. So that is 8,000 years relative to 2K. So the uh, green means here more carbon at 8,000 years ago. But you can see that here in Africa, we have much more carbon because of uh, much gr greener and denser vegetation here. Uh, but in general, on the planet, we have less carbon in particular because we have less uh, CO2 fertilization at that time, in, according to the model. And uh, we generally have drier uh, climate, for instance, here uh, in Amazon. So in total, we have about 50 gigaton of carbon less at the 8K. And that was a bit of surprise because if you do offline simulation with GS Bach, we come to much bigger value, like 100 petagram of carbon because CO2 fertilization is quite effective. And then if you go from this, again, taking 2K as a re reference period, and then we go to the IPCC uh, pre-industrial 1850 period, then we see that there is this brown color, so land loses carbon mostly because of uh, historical deforestation. So these patterns uh, reflect in very much uh, our scenario, which is in that case uh, coming from George Hutt data. <clears throat> Uh, what is interesting in our run is that we used a new volcanic record. It's coming from Greenland, so it might be that we overdid it because in Greenland uh, a lot of uh, sulfate deposition are coming from Iceland, volcanic, so that's uh, a caveat in our analysis. But what's interesting in is that around these 5.2K events, we have not much strong eruptions, but we have a longer period of uh, sulfate sulfate deposition in Greenland, and uh, that was a forcing to the model. And if you look at how carbon cycle respond to this volcanic eruption, so we did several simulations. One of them I was showed before was a nitch CO2, but I want to also throw results from prescribed CO2, where we just prescribe CO2 exactly in the uh, ISCO record. And then we see that during the beginning of eruption when the temperature gets colder by about one degree, we have first increase in land carbon storage because respiration becomes less, but when there is abrupt decrease because uh, <coughs> productivity declines and then we just go much lower than we had on land in, in advance. And if you try to diagnose CO2, then you will have quite a substantial changes. If we have interactive CO2, as here on the right, the increase in CO2 is or changes are not that dramatic, 
and uh, it's also important how we just drive the ocean carbon cycle. But generally, we have this period when we have a response of both land and ocean uh, to the external forcing. And uh, if you look at the patterns of distribution, so here the red is a gain of carbon at the peak of volcanic eruption. So you can see that in total, we have more or less reddish colors everywhere and subtropics, a bit of tropics. So in, uh, in the core of uh, tropical forest, we have a decline because there is less productivity. But if you look in biomass, biomass declined basically everywhere. And, but in general, if you look at the total carbon, uh, we have some surplus. And uh, based on that, we actually can try to find out what is the strength of a feedback, uh, carbon feedback in our model, in particular because that's a new model. We also want to use it for CMIP-6 analysis. And uh, when we go into the standard carbon cycle analysis, I just put here a few equations, so we have a derivative towards the changes in temperature, towards the atmospheric CO2, yeah, so it's usual gamma and beta in this analysis. And then I also put Xi because we also change in surface in the, so changes in the surface ocean alkalinity in our experiments, and it's essential to account for that. And then we have uh, five unknown parameters, gamma, beta for land and ocean, and this alkalinity sensitivity, and then we have actually three experiments here. We have two interactive ones for this period, and uh, we have six linear equations. We have uh, five variables, so we have our determined system, so then it's easy to find out uh, what parameters are. And then we can find them out and map it on particular CMIP-5 models. So for climate sensitivity, we have about the same sensitivity as in CMIP-5 simulation, so it is a red dot here, the alpha. So for land response for beta, uh, we have actually uh, because system is overdetermined, we can say something about uncertainty, so it's beta is quite uncertain, but generally it is within the range and also within the range of what we have in uh, CME5 in our model. For gamma, we have a, uh, for land, we have much less value because we use a new land surface uh, or soil carbon model YASA, and YASA has uh, much more carbon in the fast pool, which seems to be reasonable. And then our gamma is much reduced, even without nitrogen, accounting for nitrogen. And uh, because of that, uh, so we have smaller gamma, and if you try to calculate the gain factor, so in our new model, the carbon feedback uh, has twice less gain than in CMIP5. So instead of 10%, we have something like 5% amplification factor. I thought it's still positive. Uh, now I come to my conclusion, so I try to show that full-scale ESMs are now capable to do long-term simulations, so it's feasible to do it. We also try nudge CO2 mode because otherwise it's not interesting to look in the carbon cycle. Land carbon feedback, gamma is positive, well, I found that. CO2 fertilization is negative, no surprise. I have not talked about pit accumulation, which would make a simulation even more complicated, but it's also negative feedback. We found that land carbon changes explain CO2 after 2,000 years ago, but I'm going to talk about biophysical feedback, but they are minor in our way, and uh, we are just coming to the point of setting up initial condition for this equilibrium, uh, for this transient run. It's a challenge. We want to learn something from IMIX. My last slide is the announcement of a conference we have in Hamburg at the end of August, so you are welcome to submit an abstract very soon. Thank you. So thank you, Victor. I will open the floor for. Um, thank you for sticking to the time frame. Um, open the floor for um, any questions. Yes, we do. It will be about a year. Yeah, so that's one year. I mean, we, the main trouble we have with ECA model, it's difficult to parallelize it, so we just stop doing that. So with 60 years a day, you can easily calculate uh, that we need about a year to make this run. But uh, this Holosan run was about half a year, and uh, basically we set up several runs in parallel, so it's 
possible, it's feasible, it just doesn't take much out of computer time because we use very few nodes of a computer. Any more question? Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you, said, you said that the biophysical effects are small. And this is in spite of massive changes in land cover and land use. Please, if you might. Well, that's what we see in our uh, Earth system models because you, land cover changes are usually have an impact on atmosphere through the regional effects. So regionally, it can be quite substantial. It might be amplification, let's say, of dryness, or amplification of temperature change by about 20%. But uh, if you look at the global number, so how strong is uh, this biophysical feedback, especially during the Holocene, when changes in vegetation relative to what happened on glacial time scale are minor. So it's just within 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees of global temperature change, and that's within variability of a climate system. So we basically have a trouble to see these uh, changes on, uh, on this due to very low uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Yes? Uh, yeah, we, are to we just did experiment where we just fixed ice sheet to present day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so in this simulation, we have not played with it. When we use the intermediate complexity model and change uh, the, uh, we assume that there was a remains of Laurentide ice sheet, and there is a local effect on that on vegetation in North America, but effect on global climate is minor because it's uh, limited. Any more question? Yeah, one more. Um, the lady in red. Yeah, I, I fully agree that if you just talk, look at the North, North America, of course, uh, if you assume that there are no ice sheet there, remains of Laurentide ice sheet, it's unrealistic. So just to, to make this experiment correct, we need uh, to do degradation run, which would be just a, a next step. Uh, so our main concern here was uh, with carbon budget, and uh, we don't think that these ice sheets uh, remaining there affect much uh, the carbon storage. Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, with that, I would like to um, go to the next talk by um, Jed Kaplan from the University of Lausanne. So this will be the last talk, not the last talk in this session, but the last talk on vegetation and interaction of climate um, at the more recent geologic times. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Fine. I like podiums. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Great to be here. And uh, I think that uh, watching the last few talks, for those of you who've been here this morning, you've really already started to get an idea of how much progress we have actually made in modeling what I would call paleo vegetation modeling. So modeling uh, the Earth's vegetation over long time scales. And I'm gonna talk a little about the late quaternary. I think that Victor's talk was really sort of trailblazing and showing um, where this is going in the future. And obviously I don't have any of his slides in my own presentation. But what I, what I wanna do first of all is, um, is emphasize that I'm, I'm certainly standing on the shoulders of giants here. Many of, many of these people are actually in the room. So um, thank you to everyone who pioneered paleo vegetation modeling and also obviously to the, to the generous people who give us money to work on this kind of, these exciting topics. Why are we doing paleo vegetation modeling? Well, we are interested in the way the Earth system works. And obviously the Earth's land surface is a very important part of the Earth system. 
And studying changes in the Earth's land surface in the past really give us an opportunity to understand how the Earth system behaves uh, in a time for which we have some independent evidence of what's going on. Okay, so we have a couple of, I would say, relatively influential papers talking about uh, the role of the Earth's land surface in the climate system or in the Earth system in the past. And I would just now give you kind of a very, 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 very quick overview of the sort of history of paleovegetation modeling. Um, and I've left out a lot of papers that are there, but just to give you some of the ones that I think were more, most important, most influential in uh, the way this is evolved over the last 25 years or so. So the first evidence I could find of a, of a study that really did paleovegetation modeling comes not that long ago. It's, a, as I said, 25 years ago, 1992, before color printers were invented. You could color, take color pencils and color into maps as you want. Here's a simulation of global vegetation at the last glacial maximum. Um, just shortly there afterwards, we had the, the original sort of bio model, and you've seen already a couple of maps from different presentations this morning, and I'm probably, I'm sure that maybe some of you have run into them in the past. Um, global maps of vegetation that were uh, for here, for, for the sort of present day, uh, and for the last glacial maximum um, already uh, now 25 years ago. This is sort of the beginning of paleo vegetation modeling, if you want. Um, as soon as these paleo-vegetation models existed then, people try to, scientists try to use them to study various interesting aspects of the Earth system. And so one of those here is an example of uh, glacial inception. Why do, glacial, why do ice ages start? Is there a land atmosphere feedback associated with uh, glacial inception? And is that related to vegetation cover change? So here was a nice paper. And various other works over the years have followed up on that. Another one is the sort of vexing problem of the so called Green Sahara. Why was the Sahara, uh, why does the vegetation of the Sahara appear to uh, indicate more humid conditions during the Middle Holocene? What is the role of vegetation and in vegetation atmosphere feedbacks in influencing that vegetation cover? Biodiversity is also another issue that was studied with paleovegetation models, and here's just some simulations of East Asia for. Um, for uh, the last glacial maximum. If you have any questions about this, you can ask Sandy, because she's right here in the front of the room. Um, the first global vegetation models were typically what we call equilibrium models. So they would, you would run them with a climatological mean climate, and they would produce you sort of a vegetation map for a particular time slice, okay? It was, took another 10 or so years before we had dynamic vegetation models that could be used to make transient simulations. And everything that you've seen, or a lot of what you've seen, particularly what you saw now in Victor's talk uh, previously, used dynamic vegetation models. The first dynamic vegetation models were also now about 15 years ago, where we had investigated changes in this kind of glacial, interglacial carbon cycle. You can see this is still a prescient question. We still haven't actually cracked this. What happens to the terrestrial biosphere on a glacial, interglacial cycle? We were already attempting to do that now about 15 years ago. Um, Victor mentioned experiments with intermediate complexity models. Here is just some early results from one of his models showing the first attempt to do fully coupled vegetation in an Earth system model of a relatively coarse spatial resolution, as you can see in this picture. Um, the other thing that we did is we started to think about vegetation in more detail and thought, talk about regional studies. And here, just an example of some polar vegetation or Arctic vegetation that we uh, that led effectively to the development of the Biome 4 model. And you've seen now also in Camille's presentation some um, results from the Biome 4 model, which refuses to die, I think, because it's sort of a is somehow very simple and easy to use. Um, and it has been used in many cases to diagnose, to provide a very rapid diagnostic of climate model output. So, so it can be hard to look at a map of temperature or precipitation anomalies and know what that actually means for, um, for sort of global climate. But when you plug those into a vegetation model, you can very rapidly get these kind of biome maps, which sort of allows you to very quickly and in a holistically way understand how one model, one climate model produces a climate that is different from another. Um, by 2005, we had the first sort of fully coupled 
Earth system models that included dynamic vegetation, which is already, you know, 12 years ago or so. But uh, again, you can see it's relatively low resolution and with very, very simple vegetation models. Oh, I really, I can see my slides over here. This is pretty good. Um, now, so paleobiogeochemistry, really we started to get into this around 10 years ago following up on the sort of challenge that was placed to the community. What is the role of the uh, Earth's vegetation in influencing global biogeochemical cycles over long time periods? And we did that, well, I don't have any particular results to show you here, just a few pretty color maps of uh, vegetation change over the late Quaternary. But uh, these kind of paleobiogeochemical studies also linked to studies on anthropogenic land cover change, and there were a whole slew of papers between 2008 and 2012, and it's still ongoing, it's a new, newer, newer paper by Benny Stocker I didn't put on here now, um, trying to understand the role of human influence on Earth's vegetation cover, influencing the carbon cycle and climate over uh, pre-industrial time. And that, of course, um, we can show, for example, in a pretty animation like this. And actually, what I wanted to say to, uh, in response to Victor's presentation now, is that a lot of your uh, estimate of how much humans influence the global carbon cycle over the Holocene depends, of course, on how much you think humans influence land cover over the Holocene. And this is a very controversial topic, as many of you know, uh, something that we're still very much working on to try to improve our understanding of the relationship between humans and the environment. Within the last few years, five years or so now, we've got to transient paleobiogeochemistry, so not just looking at uh, methane emissions or atmospheric composition at particular time slices, but actually trying to understand how those evolved over time. It's really kind of brown, groundbreaking study by Joy Singerayer and her colleagues. And uh, also things like the transient effect of climate, so rapid climate change on biogeography. It's a very interesting study of glacial vegetation. And Finally, uh, a study that we just published last year showing how humans might have influenced forest cover already at the last glacial maximum. Okay, so I have just a couple minutes left to talk to you about what I feel like are the current situation and known limitations in vegetation modeling, paleo vegetation modeling. Vegetation models do a pretty good job of capturing the broad patterns of global biogeography. If we take West Africa, for example, most vegetation models can simulate the transition from the humid coast to the Sahara Desert. Okay? This models do well. But, and that's led to all kinds of great improvements in our understanding of the Earth system. But models are still weak at a lot of things. Okay? Vegetation models all of the vegetation models that you've seen presented this morning and all the ones that you see and all the papers that you read still have some major limitations and room for improvement. Okay? For example, simulating ecotones is not something models do very well. And this is an interesting ecotone here. You have a forest in the background. You have some kind of um, shrub step in the foreground. You also have these grazers on the landscape. Okay, most vegetation models don't have any, uh, any way of representing the influence of grazers on vegetation. The other thing most vegetation models do is simulate global vegetation in a very simple way as a function of just a few plant functional types. Some models have moved towards trying to um, simulate species level vegetation composition. This has uh, basically been done at regional scale. Obviously, it'd be very hard to simulate individually all of the over 3,000 palm species that we heard about this morning. So, um, but we perhaps could influence, we could improve our representation of the variety of global vegetation by increasing the number of plant functional types represented in our models. Most models have fire as its disturbance, but most models only have fire as their only disturbance, okay? And we all know, or many of us know, that there are all other kinds of disturbances that affect ecosystems. Plant dispersal and migration is another issue. I'll show you just an example of that, but just look at this mountain landscape for, 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 for a minute. Um, there's all kinds of disturbance going on here, geomorphic disturbance, these landslides, see avalanche gullies. You see um, erosion and uh, deposition features along, this, along the Skeena River here. Okay? None of these effects, and uh, they may be local. So if you zoom out and think about just the whole world, perhaps they're not so important. 
But I do think that there is room for improvement in representing these kind of disturbance processes and other very important ones like insect outbreaks in global vegetation models. Talk for a second about um, migration and dispersal. What you're seeing here in this animation is a simulation we did with a simple vegetation model that focuses on one process in particular, and that is the migration and dispersal of vegetation. And you're seeing that run through a rapid climate change experiment at the end of uh, the last glacial cycle. And you'll see here in a second how these different uh, plant taxa, tree taxa, effectively migrate onto the landscape over time. Once we start to improve the temporal and spatial resolution of global models, and we're starting to see that now in the presentation of Victor and others, okay, then, we can, then we really start to need to start thinking about these processes that are not included in vegetation models. Another one is nutrient cycles. Sönke gave a great presentation this morning about the importance of having an interactive nitrogen cycle in a global vegetation model. Okay, so we're kind of getting there with nitrogen. We actually have some pretty good nitrogen models. But few models represent other mineral, mineral nutrients. And how do we deal with landscapes like this? Okay, this is a picture from New Caledonia where you have ultramafic uh, bedrock. It's extremely nutrient poor. The climate by itself might suggest it should be covered with rainforest or something. But actually it has this kind of very interesting partly bare and partly um, partly sort of shrubby and grassy type of vegetation that's related to nutrient limitations. Is that only a local effect or is that, a, or is that globally important? I think that's something that we don't actually know very well. Finally, we talked about human management of ecosystems. I mentioned that this is something that's ongoing and controversial. Our representation of the human management of ecosystems is limited not only in the paleo context, but also in the future. It's something that we definitely need to improve, taking into account things like animal production on landscapes, for example, will be a high priority for future research. So yeah, or the construction of these kind of engineered landscapes, I would say, which is also, which are not only beautiful, but also have big impl impacts on biodiversity and hydrology and so on. So I'm on my last slide. Um, we're making great progress, yes, but we could do more. And so I would put it out as a challenge to the community to not sort of think that vegetation modeling, especially paleo vegetation modeling, is a done deal. We are improving spatial temporal resolution. We're improving the number of processes we resolve and the types of vegetation that we resolve. And there will be a lot more work to do on this in the future. Thank you. Thanks for the intriguing talk. Um, I would like to open the floor for any question. So, if I may ask a question on priorities. So, of course, if you have 10 priorities, they are not priorities. What is your one super priority? Well, of course, I, of course, Victor, I have my pet priorities. Um, but I think that vertical structure of vegetation is probably one of the most important ones that we are missing because it, it impacts the um, canopy, the, so the, the canopy micrometeorology, the d way in which disturbance propagates through, um, through, through vegetation. And while there are some models that represent 2D or 3D structure in vegetation, there, not met, there are not many. And uh, not many of those are being used, if any, at global scale. And so I think that computational limitation, we, we are less limited by computational pro, you know, demand than we were in the past. And that's something where we could really make a big improvement. Uh, yeah. Okay, Jen, I've got to say this. Um, in response to Victor as well. The one thing you've missed out on this, and the absolute priority, is data to validate these models. <laughs> morning, you run a model, you get some results, and you put more and more parameters in, you make it more and more complex, and it's, it's very loud. I'm sorry, it's not real unless you can validate those parameters and those distributions. Yes. You're, you're absolutely right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And actually, I... I um I think we're in an exciting time for collecting more data because we have a lot more people collecting data, we have lots more ways of managing data, and we even have some interesting new technologies like things like drone-based LIDAR, which are going to be able to give us 
in a cheap way, a three-dimensional picture of what a vegetation structure looks like and allow us to inventory biomass, that's going to help. <laughs> okay. Well, in a paleo, yes. 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 Um, one question from the guy, gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thanks for a great. Thanks for a great talk. This is more common than a common than a question, but perhaps you can I react to it. Uh, it seems to me that our understanding of the in the climate community of the impact of climate change for the land surface are informed by simple toy things like the Palmer Drought Index or a PDSI, that's what you see mainly, and it projects a drier surface because temperature is going up, and it doesn't seem to me that it's, it squares very well with you know, uh, conclusions from paleo climate and vegetation modelers. So perhaps one of the priorities, or, or one of the uh, needs, or, or the excellent things that could happen with conclusions from that line of work to be uh, more prevalent, maybe, in our understanding of future impacts of uh, it seems to me that there's a discrepancy there that should uh, somehow be resolved. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I think there's, we tend to like to simplify things. And again, that's why people have used a biomodel as a diagnostic of climate model output. So instead of doing PDSI and saying, oh, here's going to be positive negative drought or, or pluvial, um, perhaps better is to kind of take that another level and say, here's what the actual impact of that um, climate variability would have on on, uh, on carbon or on vegetation structure or, or um, land cover and so on. Um, and coming back to, okay, so I, to link that to Sandy's previous point, yes, we need more paleo data and we need more paleo data at high temporal resolution because we, a lot of what we're talking about in the future is climate change occurring on sort of centennial timescales and the, a lot of the paleo data we have has not been collected in a way that's going to allow us to investigate those things. And that's really, that's a, that would be a critical priority, absolutely. Uh, I have one more question on, a short question on PFT. So following on the other questions, um, for example, how do you take into account the, the um, evergreen and deciduous plant? Because we know that these two plant groups respond differently at elevated CO2. So in mixed deciduous forests, for example, where we have evergreen and um, deciduous, how does the model take into account that aspect? Yeah, I, I think phenology, so evergreen versus deciduousness, is, is one of the um, primary uh, distinguished determinants in, pl in, plant, in modern plant functional type usage. So almost all PFT classifications include some kind of um, phenological distinction, let's say, for trees. Now, for shrubs and grasses, completely different. And there, um, this, uh, there's also a lot of room for improvement and understanding the way that phenology, um, phenological diversity uh, exists in, in um, herbaceous and shrubby vegetation. Okay, thank you. So with that, um, I would like to, well, our next speaker, Pierre Jantin, did his talk um, has been canceled and we will fill that 15 minute um, time with um, pres a short presentation from our poster presenters. So we have three um, poster presenters who um, have uploaded their slides. And so we'll give about, let's say around three um, to two minutes for each um, poster presenter. So this is a, a golden opportunity for yourself to sell your research and to advertise your project. Oh yeah, that would be great. So, um, so the first slide. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Dr. Arun Jyotinath, uh, assistant professor in Assam University, Shilchar, Assam, India. So here, uh, my talk is on uh, whether or not uh, restoration of degraded lands through rubber plantation helps storing soil organic carbon in recalcitrant pool. So soil organic carbon in soil resides in two forms. Uh, one in uh, active form that is readily available to the plants uh, utilization and another in the recalcitrant pool that is which is also called as passive pool uh, which remains in a soil over a long period of time. So here in this study uh, 
we opted uh, ace chrono sequences of rubber plantation uh, having different ages from 6 to 34 year old rubber plantation and compared the carbon total carbon stock as well as carbon in active and passive pool with that of native forest vegetation as well as the uh, imperata grasslands. We opted imperata grassland because the rubber plantation was developed on the or planted on a imperata grassland. Uh, this shows the total carbon stock uh, for 0 to 20 top layer, 0 to uh, 20 centimeter soil and this uh, for 0 to 100 centimeter, like one up to 1 meter soil there. Uh, this implies that uh, with the increase in age of the plantation, uh, the total soil carbon stock increases, but this was much less than the forest soil carbon stock, but this was uh, more, around 20% more than the uh, grassland carbon stock. Then we compared the active and passive carbon pool for different ACE chrono sequence as well as the uh, forest and the imperata grassland and this shows for up to one meter depth this rubber plantation can store more of the carbon in recalcitrant pool over that either of uh, forest or the grassland. And the reason uh, we explored and that shows the litter production uh, for the mature plantation for about 15 years Above ground litter production increases uh, like 8 megagram per hectare, then the, carb then the uh, or uh, soil organic matter uh, they tries to store in the form of recalcitrant pool. So the conclusion of the study is that uh, managing old age rubber plantation can help storing uh, soil organic carbon in the recalcitrant pool and which is very important in the context of climate change mitigation and therefore restoration of degraded land through rubber plantation can enhance carbon sink capability of the soil. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Um, I will, so I would like to ask you to, um, the participants to cut down your presentation to one minute. The next one. Uh, dear colleagues, our poster presents uh, results of uh, climate-vegetation interaction in European Russia, and we focused our study in early Holocene. We took three profiles in different vegetation zones of European Russia, from boreal forest, temperate forest, and ecotone of for forest steppe. Uh, uh, our reconstruction are based on pollen, uh, detail pollen analysis, plant uh, macrofossils, detail radiocarbon da dating, uh, cl climatic parameters and the total woody coverage was reconstructed by uh, modern analog uh, uh, technique. And so we uh, uh, used, we reconstructed some additional moisture parameters as, as evapotranspiration and potential evaporation. And our results show that uh, early Holocene was not so dry in uh, European Russia as was assumed before. And the uh, cl climate was very uh, rather wet. Uh, vegetation cover was not so dense and was represented by uh, very open uh, pine and birch vegetation. So we have very clear transition from, from early Holocene to mid-Holocene uh, thermal maximum. And also we trace some evidence about rapid climate, uh, climate uh, uh, oscillation and the reaction of vegetation with climate uh, uh, deterioration as uh, event, uh, cooling event of uh, 8,000 uh, uh, 8,200 uh, years BP, and uh, we trace some preboreal oscillation. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> so next presenter. Okay, I'm back just to, to present a poster of my student, Philip Summer, couldn't be here, unfortunately. Um, we're trying to model human environment interactions in pre-industrial time and go to the next slide. Uh, essentially what we're trying to, what, what we are doing is realizing that there are properties of the physical environments that d d determine human environment interactions and there are socio-cultural characteristics of humans that we cannot predict on the basis of any properties of the physical environment. And we're just acknowledging that 
and saying, okay, we're going to use that information. Fortunately, for the past, we actually have information about the characteristics of different societies on the, from archeological and historical records. And we put those together into a human environment interactions model and the outputs of those will be things like land use, land cover, and human population. So we're moving away from a population-driven land use model to something that is more driven by the characteristics of society and the environment in which they live. Come see the poster uh, to learn more. Thank you, Jed. So our next speaker is um, Jody from Wageningen University. And, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, one, one minute. <laughs> Uh, so, my name is Steve Laid. I'm from the Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University, and my poster number is X4498, so you know where to go this afternoon. Um, I'd like to open, uh, as, uh, during that poster, the, what you could call the Pandora's box of biodiversity. So, we know climate change will affect biodiversity, but what about the other way around? Does, will biodiversity loss affect climate change? In, the, in a deep time perspective, I would say the answer is yes. But the subject of my poster is uh, 21st century climate change, and there the answer is a bit less certain. There are a few different hypotheses out there, and our poster is, uh, starts by reviewing those hypotheses. So, for example, there's the adaptive capacity hypothesis that loss of biodiversity will lead to a decrease in the ability of the biosphere to adapt to climate change. There are also some hypotheses that involve direct effects, for example, uh, less biodiversity will be, mean less ability to exploit all niches in the ecosystem and therefore decreased carbon storage. Um, in our poster, we don't seek to test which, which of these are true, but we review the literature for these different hypotheses, implement them in a very simple, stylized carbon cycle model, uh, stylized because defining biodiversity is so difficult, and then we use that model to test how important these different aspects of the relationship between biodiversity and climate change could be. Thanks. Thank you. So, our next speaker, without further ado, Jody. Yeah, hello. Let's make an effort first because I'm going to talk about sub daily scales. So we remove from million of air a years, and then we are going to talk about hours and minutes. And here I just present the, the outlet of the Amazonian River, and this is the Atlantic Ocean, and this you really see the flow moving, and you see how rich is the interaction could be between ocean, land, and the vegetation. If I, if I zoom here, in one of the outlets, we really see also that clouds are really just moving and really just forming deep convection. And I can go more in detail and there are very nice features. For instance, here, we really see that above the river, due to combination of thermal and frictional effects, there are no clouds. Whereas, if clouds are really moving with that sort of strip, street structure, we really see that at the end is deep convection. So we are really just fully interested how is this coupling between vegetation and the atmosphere, and how can really just be included on weather and climate models. The idea behind is that we need to really just go up and bridge between scales, and we try to do it as explicit and using first principles as possible. The main thing is that we have the leaf here, we'll have the carbon assimilation and the evapotranspiration, but then we have clouds that they are really shading and influencing here with a changing on the radiation structure, and then we have other structures like that sort of street clouds that they are really also influencing how clouds are really just populating the land. And finally, we could really see transitions between small what we call it shallow cumulus, the typical fair, fair weather clouds, and that a quick transition to deep convection. So in very short, the questions that we are trying to tackle in the, in the frame of the typical weather that is 10 by 10 kilometers, I just watched in the CNWF presentation, and this is the typical kilometer square of the grid, is what are the key interactions in the vegetation cloud system and how do they manifest in surface fluxes and in cloud dynamics. And I'm very much interested on that sort of, what I call it, the sub-regional variability, what's going on inside. So let, let, let me allow, allow me to tell the, what are the challenges. The first challenge is that we are trying to, clouds and aerosols influence radiation. There is a perturbation of the direct and the diffuse radiation. And this will have a different response on the plant's stomatal response that will affect the surface energy balance the partition between sensible and latent heat flux, 
And this will influence thermals, that they are the ones that they are carrying the moisture through really just form clouds. So here it's a very nice cycle of the atmosphere vegetation interaction. So first challenge is that we are really have to scale up from the leaf scale and that we have to distinguish that they are leaves that is sunlit or shaded. We have to go to the canopy, that's defined by meters, leaf and leafless, also with the influence of clouds. And then also we have to go what we call it the atmospheric boundary layer between meters and kilometers to really just merge it in a large vegetation uh, environment. So interaction of scales. The second thing is that the system is changing dramatically. This is a photo that I got from Matthias Sorgel from Max Planck, and it shows one minute on the Amazon. He was climbing in 150 meter tower and he's taking pictures every one minute. And you really see the influence of clouds and also pay attention on the different colors of the clouds. So clouds are not really a just a junk, it's really just the difference of clouds in the op cloud optical depth can have an impact on the on the vegetation. So you see here that after one minute, there are strong differences on how radiation is the radiation above the top canopy. In addition of the radiation, there is also influence on turbulence that can also have influence on the temperature and the water vapor deficit. So the idea behind is how to investigate it as explicit as possible using first principles, that sort of coupled system. And we have, in principle, now we are pushing forward. We are really in measurements. We are using some sort of centimeter. This is, uh, we are sending uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, signal and we are sealing, for instance, this is the available radiation and we see how carbon is, if ca clouds are passing, how carbon is really just dropping in and evaporation. So there is a signal of the amount of radiation that we have in our field. But I will focus on the larger dissimulation. This is a three-dimensional model with a grid of 50 meters. We try to really just solve as much as possible of the explicitness of the system. And what we really see here, it's in a scale of 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers, typical one of the climate. How is the variation of evaporation because the cloud is shading? So that's an effect that we try to do it. I will show you afterwards a film. So it's larger dissimulation. We go to cubes of 10 by 10 by 10 cube meters in order to resolve as explicit as possible the atmospheric motions and the coupling with the vegetation. And we are interested in the coupling between biosphere, atmospheric boundary layer, and free troposphere. Allow me to show a movie. And this shows, in a way, it shows the, the wind field. But it's more important that you pay attention on these red dots. That is the shading of the cloud above the canopy top. And you will really see, this is a typical hour. It's, now it's in the middle, it's noon. And you see that after the cloud is passing, the plant has been reacting. So it's this, the, what we call it, the canopy resistance that is sim similar to the closing and, uh, closing and opening of the aperture of the stomata. So you see how dynamic is the system. In that case, we have taken into account some sort of asymmetry that the, the plant is closing in five minutes and is opening in 10 minutes. So what we do afterwards is that by doing that sort of large eddy simulation, we are able to do very much systematic experiments. And I'm going to present two highlights. I don't have so much time. One is referred to what we call it transparent clouds to really decouple the effect of radiation compared also to the shading clouds. And we, are, we can also have wind, stomatal time response, and radiation. So we can perform a lot of systematic uh, experiments. First experiment, we are going to focus in two axes. I'm going to start with no wind, an instantaneous response of the stomata. And in the second example, to close, I'm going to see how, what is the influence of the lag, opening and closing of the stoma, versus a situation with wind. This is the first result. So we see the cloud is hardly not moving. It's shading. And this is the result of the larger dissimulation. I'm thinking here that it's uh, around 100 meter, uh, 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters. Oh, and you see how rich is the data that we are really just getting. We are seeing that there is some shading. And if you compare with this, with a, that sort of cross-section, we see the cloud optical depth, a measure of how, how thick is the cloud, combined with the red curve, that is the direct radiation and the diffuse radiation. So with this, we see for the same area that evaporation has been dropping. And there are areas with evaporation uh, with the same level. And what we do is what we call it conditional average. So we are really just seeing which areas are really just affected by different cloud optical depth. And we obtain a very interesting result. That's the following. I'm going to compare here evaporation or the flux of carbon dioxide against the clear value. And here is the thickness of the cloud. So zero is that there are no clouds. 12 is I have a very dense cloud, optically speaking. 
What we see that is very interesting is that for relatively thin clouds, evaporation and the flux of carbon dioxide have increased. So it means that no matter direct radiation has been decreasing, there is an increase of the diffuse radiation due to clouds and due to the high penetration in the canopy. So there is a positive effect, and this happens also in an area where the aerosol optical death can happen. Sensible heat flux drops, but I, I insist and I stress, carbon dioxide and evaporation have an area where there is an increase. That's the first result. I move now to wind and to some sort of uh, delay or symmetric between uh, opening and closing of 10, 20 minutes and asymmetric. And here we are really getting much more complicated. We did uh, 42 large eddy simulations. These are quite expensive computationally speaking. With soil moisture partially limiting grass photosynthesis, we take into account the sun is always overhead. And this is a typical example of typical mid-latitude shallow cumulus. What we find is quite curious is that I'm going to go, this is the transparent case against all the 42 experiments. We see that the global radiation, no matter there are clouds, is highly affected. So it seems that all the system collapse. And for instance, with sensible heat flux, we really see that before clouds appear, that is here, sensible heat flux has a large variation due that the wind is really just increasing the sensible heat flux. But as soon as clouds appear, there is some sort of balance and the curves tends to collapse. The same happened with the latent heat flux. No matter we have clouds, no matter we have really just a lot of variability, it seems that there is some sort of couple system that there is a lock system that uh, surface fluxes are very tied to the, what is happening to the clouds. So this br brings us to the, the last question, is that how do we introduce, how do we transfer all that sort of information obtained by the larger dissimulation to a global model or a weather model? And I put you just a simple example that we also repeated. Imagine that we have a cloud cover, and in that case we can able to simulate it in our larger dissimulation by 20%. Normally, in a climate or regional model, this is a 20% over the grid, is homogeneously distributed. So we have the same amount of energy, but now it's scatterly distributed, locally distributed or instantaneously distributed against something that is homogeneously distributed. So we can repeat that sort of larger dissimulation and this is what I'm doing and I'm going to present my large result where I show that sort of heterogeneous dynamically distribution against a fixed distribution like a climate or weather model. And what I'm presenting here is on the vertical is Z and here is the liquid quantity of a cloud and there is a large difference at cloud base. So the way that we are really just distributing the energy due to the coupling of cloud can really just have an effect on the way that we are really parameterizing clouds in weather and climate models. With this, I would like to close. Uh, we are trying to fix a bit that sort of map of our findings. We see that the, there, is in, uh, there is no turbulence and no wind instantaneous cloud growth locally limited by surface fluxes. And there is also that sort of enhancement for thin clouds of, of uh, evapotranspiration. Whereas when we go really just with uh, wind situations, unlike the regional average flows are more, uh, fluxes are more important, but it's also relevant to really see that we need to take, take into account that sort of dynamic heterogeneity due to the presence of clouds. Thank you very much. Let's open the floor for any question. Yes, Victor. Yes, we have done this, and uh, there is there it's a very nice example because there is two of one of things is an increase of CO2, the stomach closes, and then it's, it, may, it means that there is evaporation goes down, and we have larger sensible heat flux. But larger sensible heat flux makes that the turbulence is higher, so moisture can reach higher levels and condensates. It's uh, quite tricky. We are working on this. Normally, in, that, in the first uh, simulations that we get is that there are less clouds. It is, as I show, it is very difficult because turbulence, uh, eddy covariance, you go to 30 minutes, so you are really just missing a bit of the action. We are talking about minutes. Uh, with a scintillometer that combines temporal average and line average, then we could really just see that there are certain variations. We have not yet done it, 
but we can really just go to measure turbulent fluxes with one or two minute resolution. And then we can really see the level of variation of the surface fluxes with respect to clouds. Okay, one last question. Yes, so it's, 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 it's what I show that depending of if you have thin clouds, the leaf is going to be, in that case, get a bit of less direct, but it's going to increase the diffuse radiation. And in that case, it's really just enhancing uh, uh, the, the plant transpiration. And the same for the CO2 assimilation. So this is an optimal situation for the plant. A bit of cloud, it's like to be in, our, in the beach. We don't want to be totally burned. So at least a combination of diffuse and direct is the, the perfect one for the leaf. Thank you, Victor. Um, so moving on from um, cloud and evapotranspiration, we'll move to um, forest um, cover. Um, with that, I would like to um, invite Gregory for uh, the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here and, and having been here following the whole session uh, since the beginning. And thank you for the invitation to, to actually present our work on, satellite, on using satellite uh, at, again, much shallower timescales than what we've seen. Um, but hopefully this will open uh, a bit of perhaps also perspective of what we can actually learn with the, what's actually happening now, hopefully also for modeling in the, in the past. So um, to start, I'd like to borrow this picture from Sebastião Salgado on, to, to talk about the Anthropocene. As, um, as uh, Gilles started also in the introduction, we have arguably entered the age of man, and, uh, and man has left quite a f strong mark on the, on the planet. Most of it, um, well, is partly is uh, the, the CO2 that we have been adding and pumping into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and, and the effects of land use change. And of course, vegetation has a big role there as uh, one of the major sinks. And uh, so a lot of study has been done on the carbon cycle, and especially since the sink is the most variable one. But man also has left another mark um, more on the surface. I mean, which is from space, we can see quite clearly. Um, the, and this mark has changed the surface of the planet and its properties. This has an effect uh, also a lot on the energy fluxes. And uh, as we have seen in the previous talk also um, by Jordi Villa, um, and, uh, and also these effects of land biophysics are currently not really considered in global climate treaties. Most of the focus is on carbon, yet these biophysical effects have, have, uh, have an influence, especially at local scale. This is where I'm focusing and what we're looking at because this is the, the local scale is the scale at which people live in actually. And so if you see these two, these two um, land cover types, you have a grasslands, typically it will be brighter and reflect more sunlight and that will have a cooling effect more than the forest. Well, the forest with the deeper rooting system typically can evapotranspirate more. So when you transform a forest to a grassland, for instance, you have these effects that, that can happen. Um, and on top of that, you have a seasonal aspect to these changes. Mostly linked, well, there is the albedo effect by the snow, for instance. So if we take this boreal landscape, um, you, you, can, you can imagine that the high albedo that you have because of um, the snow in this part of the picture, this is reducing, uh, um, this is reflecting so much uh, radiation that it's actually having a cooling effect. But in this, on the same time, further over there, where you have lower albedo because you have more forest, and these are needle leaf forests, they're absorbing radiation, which means that the air temperature might be higher. Similarly, management can also have an effect on evapotranspiration. In an arid landscape, typically in areas like that, you'll have very strong water limitation, therefore very low latent heat, and a high air uh, potentially high, uh, high air temperature because of a sensible heat. But if you irrigate, um, this will allow more, eva uh, more evapotranspiration and lower locally the temperature. So how to evaluate this, these impacts uh, on the vegetation cover? 
Well, we use satellite remote sensing data sets. And um, how do we use these satellites? Partly because these can help to do, um, uh, because some, uh, some products is, exist of, of forest cover or tree cover, I should say, or land cover. This is, a, of course, a, something that we have, uh, luxury that we have now looking at the present time that for paleo studies, it's much more complicated. But we also, and we also have something else. We have the big, the, the big amount of data that satellites can provide by revisiting the Earth every, uh, sometimes at sub-daily scales. Um, and uh, this is what we use. Typically here, in, well, what I'll be showing is uh, surface, land surface temperature me measured by satellites at a daily scale. Uh, or, yeah. And we have different approaches to do this because we need to, to, to it, it, there's tricks to get this, the, 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 to get the data speak to and get the, the values we want. So one of them that has been, uh, the, one of them that we use is that when, if you have a landscape like this tropical forest and it changes and there's a deforestation event that occurs and we have these squares that represent my coarse pixels, for instance, of land surface temperature, I will see an effect on the, because of this uh, land use change. But this effect is, is both of that pixel. This effect is not only the effect of the land use change, but it's also an effect of climate. And we'll typically look at nearby pixels to see a pixel that has not suffered change to see what is the effect of the climate and what is the effect to factor out the effect of the land cover change from the effect of, of the climate. And this is an actual change, no? The forest did change, and we're measuring before and after what's happening. Now, more specifically, and this is the work of my colleague, Ramdan al uh, that was uh, published last year, this delta T that, he, that we can measure is composed of this climate variability and this land, and, uh, and this, uh, the effect of forest cover. We can rearrange this equation like this. And what he did was, if, um, if you have a, in this graph, a map, uh, you map here the fraction of forest cover from zero to one of the forest cover in 2012. And on that axis, you have the fraction of cover in 2003. So basically in that square, you'll have less forest in 2012 than in 2003, while here you'll have more forest. Over here, you'll have pixels of stable forest cover. Over there, you have losses, uh, forest losses and forest gains, basically. And he plots then all the measurements we get for every pixel in this space. And you get this, this mess, let's say. Now, what is the local climate variability, uh, the, the signal due to the climate variability? To do that, he looks at around the pixel, at pixels that have not changed, as I told you before. And he gets the same kind of surface. And when you subtract them, you end up with quite a clear signal in which, um, for a given area in which we have done these measures, um, you, you, you see that going from a point A in which we have full forest to a point B in which we have deforested totally the, the area, there is a change. Uh, the, the, these values represent the amount of, temp of temperature, of land surface temperature that we expect, that, that, that is actually, a, that we can expect for a full transition. And then when you do that for different areas, you get these kind of maps in which uh, you see that the tropical, in the tropical belt, there is a strong local effect of deforestation, while in the more boreal latitudes, there's sometimes a mild effect. This is an annual mean. And, uh, but then this is only the actual change that has occurred. It's a forest that has been deforested in the past, in, from 2003 to 2012. What happens if we don't have past data? What if, the, uh, first, if we don't have a map of what has ch changed, or what if the change has not occurred? And so I'm thinking about other land cover changes, changes like maybe uh, plants of afforestation, where we, don't, might, we might not have a place, in a, in a place where there is no forest now, and we plant a forest, it's difficult to see, uh, I mean, we don't have a change. Um, so the idea is here that locally, over a given window, we can assume that we can trade space for time and look at uh, how different that pixel is in the center from its neighbors. Um, this is a potential change, no? And it's more, in, if you see a landscape like that, you, it, it's basically looking at, at, the, at that pi uh, the pixel over here and the temperature, the land surface temperature that that pixel has and compare it to that one, which is perhaps the grassland that that forest might at one point be turned into. Of course, I'm not talking about the direct transition. The direct transition will look perhaps more like uh, after a deforestation event about what you have over there, where you have like 
a place where, which was recently deforested. But this is the stable, more stable land cover that you can expect after a given time. And uh, this technique, basically, we use a, a percent cover of different plant functional types that we map in a, in a space like that, in which we put the percentages. And we, we take the values for a moving window of five by five. Actually, it's, this is 25 kilometers, five by five pixels of five kilometers. And the color of the points are the values of uh, land surface temperature. And the, the axes are the, the percentages of, um, of, uh, of each uh, cover. So it's a compositional space, no? They need to add up to one. And the assumption is that we can, we can extract, from this information, we can actually extract the, the effect of land cover change. Now, well, it's a multiple linear regression in which, uh, the, but I'm not going to go into the detail of that. The idea is that we're, we want to know what happens when we go from this point to that point by modeling a surface that goes across these points. And here we see a quite a clear gradient so from A to B. And we'll have that for every pixel, and we'll be able to make a map out of that uh, with the uh, uncertainty associated to it. Now, we have to upscale this to, the, uh, to a coarser scale to, um, for, for other reasons in which I'm not going to go into details here, but this is the, the map that we get out of that. And it's quite similar to, uh, to, the, to the map that was done. So, th so this is potential change. No? It's quite similar to the map that Ramdan al kama did on the, on the actual change. Um, um, but these are, yeah, these are preliminary results because we're still tuning a couple of things, so we shouldn't take it just for granted like that, but, and including all these noise that is over there. But overall, the patterns real, are the same. Now we have also, we can do this at the seasonal scale. So here I'm showing the things in the actual and the potential change um, for summer. And also here, they match quite well. And winter, and in here you see more the effect of the albedo, no, of the snow uh, cover, because in many parts of, of Europe, you actually have a cooling when you deforest, because, um, because, uh, because you're actually, because when you don't have the forest, there's more snow that is reflecting more, and this dominates the evapotranspiration effect. Now lastly, we also can explore the daily amplitude, because actually the satellites we use are measuring land surface temperature at the day and at night. And so this gives us an, an idea of the minimum and maximum temperature that we can expect in the day. And here we see that the, pretty much uh, every, uh, the temperature, uh, the daily amplitude increases across the board from our, from our results. And this is just to show you with the annual mean, the difference between the annual mean. And to stress a bit that, yeah, these things, these local effects, again, these are local effects. I'm not talking about large-scale deforestation of the whole boreal area and things like that that might have big effects on planetary scale. But so these, when they add up, might be quite less than the carbon, the, the effect of pumping carbon into the atmosphere. But locally, this has an impact on people. So to summarize, we have two methods that generally agree to, but not everywhere, and we still need to fine-tune on things to understand what's happening there. Um, and deforestation generally causes a rise in land surface temperature, particularly in the trophic peaks, but, but, uh, and, and daily amplitude rises everywhere. We have seasonal differences due to competing effects between the albedo effect and the evapotranspiration. And step forward, well, this is going to be part of a big data set in which we're going to be, in which we explore actually many land cover transitions and with different variables. We're focusing on biophysics. So be, here I'm showing land surface temperature with the, the effect of, of the, of the, of, uh, but, uh, yeah, but, but we also have uh, the, this kind of information that we relate, that we get for latent heat or sensible heat and net radiation, which actually are those which explain why the temperature goes up and down. And this data set, we hope to be able to use them in the framework of the Look for Sea project that is financing this work to benchmark land surface models and also to prototype monitoring and reporting and validation tools for, that could be used for the IPCC um, to actually quantify these biophysical effects. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Um, so, thank you for the presentation. Um, any question? Yes. Uh, 
Um, not sure what exactly you mean by the intensity of the biomass dynamic, but if it is about the, the photosynthesis, for instance, which is, this is a bit the holy grail of also remote sensing, I mean, of, yeah. Um, we indirectly, um, there are some techniques that are providing new avenues towards that, but it's, it's not straightforward. We, uh, I mean, biophysical effects are actually perhaps easier to get because these are um, physical measures that are changing. Not albedo, this is perhaps the easiest thing we can do with remote sensing because um, it's really the radiation that we measure. Now, uh, photosynthesis, I mean, there's different proxies that we can have and some of them are just uh, vegetation indices from uh, near infra uh, from near infrared, which actually talk to us uh, about that. Now there's there's uh, increasing interest in fluorescence, uh, um, uh, sun-induced fluorescence that could be that has its potential to actually be more linked to GPP, and uh, new indices are coming up again also. So there is some hope, but uh, yeah, ideally we would like to see stomatal conductance from space, but. Um, I guess we're going towards that, trying to. Um, I think we um, will close the session, um, for at least for the question time. Um, so any question we can discuss with um, the presenter after, um, during lunch time. So before, um, so we have gone a long way from the past to the present time. And before we close this session, we would like to thank all the wonderful presenters and excellent talks and let's give a hand, big hand to all of them. So, um, so don't, we'd like to invite you to our poster session. So it's X4, uh, 4982506. Uh, it's a building across the road uh, from 1 to 3 to 3 p.m. <laughs>